Anna. Um, thank you. We are recording this Congress. Um, people are, are filtering in at one o'clock. I'm um, putting a sign-in sheet into the chat. If everyone can go to the sign-in sheet and go ahead and sign in. Thank you everyone for coming to the Indiana Green Party's 2021 Annual Congress. It is going to be a great day. We have a packed agenda full of great opportunities for everyone to get actively involved and advance the green movement. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, if everybody could go ahead and rename themselves in the, in the Zoom, you can click on, if you look at the participant button at the bottom, um, you can pull up all the participants, find yourself and over on the right side, you can hit more and rename. If you can rename yourself with your first name, you can leave your last name if you want and just put the city that you're in let everyone know where you're from in Indiana so we could see that we do have Hoosiers all across the state that have come here for this Congress. Again, thank you everybody for coming. This is the fifth annual Green Party Congress since we reformed in 2018. Thank you so much for coming. Again, for anybody who's just joined us, there is a sign-in sheet in the chat uh, it's a Google Doc. Please click that link and sign in. This will allow us to contact you in the future. Make sure that you are up to date on what's going on in Indiana and the Green Party. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Does anybody have anything they want to share before we start this meeting? Awesome. So we're just going to give it a couple more minutes, um, hoping that everybody that registered will be able to come. Um, has anyone here not received their email with their digital ballot? If you have not received your email with your digital ballot, please raise your hand or notify us in the chat so we can get that to you. Here in a little bit, we are going to start with local group and caucuses and committees. They're going to introduce themselves to everybody, let you know what their purpose is, their mission, their territories that they're covering, and how you can go about joining them if you want to. Again, I want to thank everybody for taking three hours out of a Saturday on a beautiful day for coming here and sitting behind your a screen and talking to us. Uh, we do have a packed agenda for really great opportunities to advance the green movement. Um, it is now 103. Let me see if I see anyone here. Do we have Mike Smith here yet? I see no Mike Smith. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on behalf of the Circle City Greens, introduce the Circle City Greens and let everyone know the area they cover, how to go about finding them and joining them? Now we have numerous Circle City Greens members. Adam, would you like to go ahead and introduce that group? Yeah, sure. I wasn't really prepared, but uh, um, so yeah, my name is Adam Mielhausen. I'm the uh, a treasurer for the Circle City Greens. We are a local group um, for the Indianapolis area. Um, this includes Marion County and all of the surrounding counties for the moment. Um, our goal is actually to get uh, each county to have their own group, um, but uh, and we're not quite at that point yet. So we're just you know trying to uh, build up the local, um, just kind of greater uh, Indianapolis area at the moment. Um, we have a couple of potential candidates for next year um, that we're pretty excited about. Um, I think we might hear from one of them a little bit later on. Um, you can find us. Uh, we have a Facebook page. We have a Twitter account. If you just search, uh, search for the Circle City Greens. Um, and then we also have our, our local group page on the Indiana Green Party website, which shows when our next meeting is going to be. We meet monthly. Um, 
I believe it's on the second or third Thursday. I would have to check the, the website again to verify that, but uh, everybody is welcome to come. Uh, and if you're in the Marion County area, especially, um, come and say hi and get connected and find out how you can help. And because um, we do have some exciting campaigns coming up next year, we're going to need all the help we can. So thanks. Thank you, Adam. That's Adam from the Circle Study Greens. And do we have, um, I see Michael Cooper on here. Michael Cooper is with the Northwest Indiana Green Party. Michael, would you mind taking the floor and introducing yourself and your group and letting people know how to go about finding you and connecting with you? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we're at Northwest Indiana Green Party. We're up here in uh, outside of Chicago uh, in the central time zone. Uh, of Indiana. Um, like many locals, we kind of took a uh, sideline with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we're slowly picking things back up uh, as things open up more uh, around uh, Northwest Indiana. So that's it. Thank you, Michael. Next up, I have Sarah Dillon with Vigo County. She's the representative for the Vigo County Greens, and she is also our fundraising committee chair. Uh, Sarah, can you speak about both of those groups for us, please? Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll get into more details later on today um, regarding the fundraising committee, um, which is a statewide committee uh, with the Indiana Green Party. But Right now, I'm going to talk about the Vigo County Green Party. I'm based out, we're based out of Terre Haute, but we do also welcome anyone from like the uh, Wabash Valley area. Right now, I'm in a car driving down from South Bend right now. Um, but we normally have two meetings a month. One's a virtual business meeting, but it's usually on the uh, Second um, second Wednesday of the month, and then we have an informal meet and greet um, at a place called Java Hote, um, uh, typically on the fourth Saturday of the month. And it, we're starting to get involved. We participated in a recent. Um, Pride Festival uh, locally, and we're starting to hit like uh, some of the other events and hopefully run some candidates next year. That's pretty much it. Great, thank you, Sarah. Next <clears throat> up, I have Neil Skywolf-Smith. Neil is the delegate to our newly formed Cannabis Caucus. He's gonna take the floor now and let you know what that caucus's mission is and how you can go about connecting and joining with them. Sky Wolf? Hi, uh, hello everybody. Uh, the Cannabis Caucus was uh, formed earlier this year uh, and uh, we have been working with uh, the organization that uh, I'm most closely affiliated with, Indiana Normal. Uh, we hope to, the Green Party has always been in favor of cannabis relegalization. Uh, there's every reason economic, there's every reason humane, there is every uh, reason for individual liberties to have cannabis legal. Uh, there are 12 states that have no cannabis legalization at all, uh, aside from CBD, uh, you know, medical cannabis or recreational use cannabis. Indiana is one of them. Um, you know, we're, we have such a reticent state government that, you know, it, it's just going to take all of us doing everything possible to legalize. Um, you know, there's, uh, I don't want to take time up here to go through whys and all that. Uh, I posted in the chat room where our uh, uh, group is for discussion. I want to see us grow. Um, <clears throat> I'm... I've been a cannabis activist since 1972. Uh, I've been an activist in one cause or another since 1968. I'm old, I'm tired, I just want to advise. Uh, currently I am um, just kind of placeholding until we get uh, the people we need to advance cannabis cause within the Green Party. Great, thank you very much. 
I'm also uh, one of the original co-founders of the Indiana Green Party. So you brought me out of mothballs. Yes, we, we appreciate all your hard work and your continued dedication to the cause. Thank you, Skywolf. Next up, we have Harrison McNabb. Harrison is our delegate for the Lavender Caucus. He will now take the floor and introduce himself and the caucus and let you know what its mission is and how you can go about connecting and, and being a part of it. Harrison? Hello, as Terry introduced, I'm Harrison. I'm the chair of the Indiana Lavender Greens Caucus. We are a LGBTQIA plus identity caucus. So we focus on LGBT issues in the state of Indiana. Uh, we meet every month, the second Tuesday. Mm -hmm. We post that on the main Facebook page whenever we do so. Uh, so if you would like to join us, keep an eye out for that. We don't have our own Facebook page yet, unfortunately. Yep. Great, thank you, Harrison. Next up, we have John from the Disability Caucus. He's gonna introduce himself, let you know what the Disability Caucus mission and goals are and how you can go about connecting and being part of that. John, you have the floor. Sure. Hello, I'm John. Um, right now I'm the, the, the chair of the Disability Caucus. Our caucus, of course, is, is to just um, uh, expand on disability rights and, and access to uh, technology to level the playing field for disabled Hoosiers, whether that's for school or work. And so trying to point our members to to different resources around the state that might help them with that. We meet uh, once a month through Zoom on uh, on the internet. And, and of course we have um, all that listed on, on Facebook as well. I, don't, I haven't really posted to the other social medias yet, but uh, we will certainly look into that as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, John. Mm -hmm, yeah. And next up, we have Bryce with the Eco Action Caucus. Bryce, mm -hmm. would you mind taking the floor, introducing yourself, letting everybody know what your caucus mm -hmm. is all about and how they can go about getting involved? Thank you. Sure, uh, my name is Bryce Gustafson here in Indianapolis. I am the delegate for the Eco Action Caucus. Uh, it is brand spanking new. Uh, we have only had uh, one meeting at this point. But uh, in my professional life, I am a consumer and environmental advocate uh, and been working on these uh, environmental issues specifically for the last 12 years. And we hope to, uh, I hope at least, uh, to continue that good work here in Indiana. We desperately need it. So uh, you can get a hold of me. Um, I put my, my email and my phone number in the uh, sign up sheet. Feel free to reach out if you're interested and we'll help. Uh, keep working, uh, fighting the good fight here in Indiana. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bryce. We have one more group to introduce and that is our Ranked Choice Voting Committee. Adam, would you mind taking the floor, introducing yourself and letting people know what that committee is about and how they can get involved? Yeah, so the whole mission of the Ranked Choice Voting Committee is obviously to uh, push Ranked Choice Voting legislation forward in the state of Indiana. And uh, we have an official partnership with a group called Better Ballot Indiana. And their entire mission as a nonprofit organization is to establish ranked choice voting in Indiana. So we work directly with them um, and we also represent <clears throat> the Green Party. So we're kind of a, a bridge between the two organizations. Um, so I do believe we're gonna be hearing from uh, the exec lead of Better Ballot Indiana later on uh, with more about ranked choice voting. So I'll just leave it at that. Great, thank you, Adam. And we are moving right along on our agenda and we're gonna have a presentation from the Move to Amend Coalition. As everybody here knows, the Green Party flat platform calls for abolishing corporate personhood, personhood. Greens want to reduce the economic and political power of large corporations, end corporate personhood and redesign corporations to serve our society, democracy, and our environment. Here today to talk to us about ending corporate personhood is Kian Bliss, Grassroots Director from Moon to Amend Coalition. Welcome, Kian. 
Hi, Terry. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming me into this space. Um, I, my name is Keon Bliss. I'm the grassroots director for the Move to Amend Coalition. Um, and um, I'm based out of here in Sacramento, California, but uh, my home and roots actually come from Indiana. I spent uh, tw over, uh, lived there for over 25 years, uh, my formative years, and um, uh, I used to live mm -hmm. up in uh, northern Indianapolis, uh, uh, near between uh, near Castleton and Fishers. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about Move to Mend. Uh, we're a nonpartisan uh, national grassroots coalition of over 475,000 individuals and hundreds of organizations committed to social, economic, and political justice, uh, and equity, ending corporate rule, and building a vibrant democratic society that is genuinely accountable to all people, regardless of race, sex, or class, and not just corporate interests. To accomplish this vision, Move to Amend seeks to amend the US Constitution to unequivocally state that corporations, artificial entities created by state law, are not people with inalienable human rights, and that money is not equal to free speech under the First Amendment, so that we can actually regulate it within our political campaigns and electoral processes. Move to Amend began as, uh, this movement as just 12 people gathered in a living room in California back in the fall of 2009 before we launched the campaign uh, on January 21st, 2010, which was the same day that the Supreme Court handed down its decision in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. As of today, we're a national coalition of over 470,000 individuals and over 500 uh, organizations growing and growing every day. While many organizations have risen to overturn Citizens United for very good reason, the root of the problem actually goes back long before 2010, and it goes much deeper than just Citizens United. In fact, for over 130 years, the Supreme Court has, like, has made a series of decisions that have extended inalienable constitutional protections to for-profit corporations and other artificial entities incorporated by state law under the first, fourth, fifth, and 14th amendments. Um, and as long as corporations are considered persons with inalienable human rights, the same as you and me, and their political spending is considered protected speech, they'll be able to assert their rights and interests better than any real human being or our communities through sheer concentration of wealth, which is why we must fight to get excessive special interest money and undo political influence by corporations out of our political process, and our solution must be comprehensive enough to leave for no loopholes. And it's for that reason, but for the past uh, going on 12 years, that Move to Amend has been clear in how we get to the root of the problem in Citizens United. We must abolish corporate constitutional rights, also known as corporate personhood, and get big money out of politics at the same time, leaving for no loopholes. Together, our coalition has drafted and supports the We the People Amendment, which was introduced in Congress uh, back in, uh, the, in, during this new session in May uh, as House Joint Resolution 48, the only proposed amendment that would address both court-created doctrines of corporate constitutional rights uh, and money equals speech, the very foundations of corporate rule. Um, and this uh, We the People Amendment would establish two key principles. First and foremost, corporations are not people meaning that constitutional rights are reserved for natural persons, human beings only, and that the legal rights of incorporated entities, corporations, that includes corporations, that includes unions, and that includes other nonprofits like ourselves and other limited liability organizations would be subject to regulation by the people through local, state, and federal law. And it would be explicitly re uh, make clear that uh, privileges recognized in the law uh, for corporations are neither inherent or inalienable, meaning we can actually hold them accountable if they violate our like our laws and, and principles. Uh, second principle would be that uh, money is not speech, meaning that the raising and spending of money in elections would no longer be construed as a form of protected political speech, we have to regulate, and that it would actually make it a duty of, the, of local, state, and federal governments to regulate, limit, or otherwise prohibit campaign finances and political spending um, as a duty. And uh, for the express purpose of ensuring that all people, regardless of how much wealth they have, have equal access to the political process. And that no person, uh, because of their wealth, gains a substantial advantage in that political process or their access uh, because of their wealth. It would also make clear that any permissible contributions, which local, state, and federal governments will still be able to do after this amendment, uh, it would require that all of those permissible contributions be publicly disclosed. And it further stipulates that none of the provisions of this amendment uh, would, would make, uh, would abridge the freedom of the press in order to do its job. So for move to amend ending corporate constitutional rights and getting, and getting big money out of politics, is not just a 
political issue for us. Any corporate rule is not just a political issue for us. This is a human rights issue that intersects with every struggle for justice that's happening today. As we all know, the US Constitution was originally written as a property rights document that only added human rights as an afterthought with the Bill of Rights. But after it was ratified, the only persons considered worthy of constitutional protections were uh, originally wealthy white male property owners, less than 10% of the early population. So if we, like for us, creating the, like building a democracy movement really is going to require us to centralize the shared realities of those that have been left behind uh, in this, uh, in our progress towards creating this, uh, this slower, slowly less than perfect union. Um, and it really requires us to make sure that we're strategizing reaching beyond just uh, our relative communities that we know and really going into uh, uh, really going beyond to really build a grassroots movement that's powerful enough to demand this movement to happen. Um, and so we, we've been doing that so far. We've got over 470,000, uh, uh, 475,000 people who have signed our national petition. If you go to move to men.org forward slash motion, you can join uh, the We the People Amendment. And we need your help as well to uh, really make sure that uh, members of Congress are supporting this movement. Um, it, uh, right now, actually, in uh, Indiana, um, we're trying to get Andre Carson, uh, Congressman for uh, District 7, uh, to sign to rejoin his colleagues. He was a previous co-sponsor in the uh, 115th Congress, um, and he uh, wants to hear from constituents uh, that uh, that they want the, him to sign on, back on to this amendment. And um, uh, we encourage you to call his, contact his office and, uh, and let him know uh, that he should join his uh, 65 other, co uh, other colleagues in signing on to this amendment. Well, right now we have uh, 65 co-sponsors uh, for House Joint Resolution 48, the We the People Amendment. And um, if you're so interested as well, uh, we also encourage you to get more involved with our coalition. Uh, right now, you, if you're uh, interested, you can sign up uh, and uh, uh, become a grassroots leader uh, by joining us um, with uh, or by joining us as an advocate uh, or forming a, a local affiliate group, as we have done in uh, over 20 states across the country. So with that, uh, I want to encourage you all uh, and support you all in your work and uh, continue uh, to work uh, move forward towards a uh, genuine democratic society. Thank you very much for coming and speaking to us today. Um, it is so very important that we strip corporations of their personhood. They are not people, they should not have our rights. Thank you so much. Everyone, I did put in the chat the petition for the move to amend. I encourage you to sign it. Also I encourage you to contact uh, Andre Carson and let your voice be heard. Let him know that we support this and we need to get out there and let them know so they will act. Thank you very much for coming and speaking with, with us today. And next on our agenda, we have our keynote speaker, Green Party Mayor of Galesburg, Illinois, Peter Schwartzman. A Mayor Schwartzman will be speaking to us today via, re, via a recording that he made last night. Uh, when he agreed to do this, he thought that he would, he thought that his schedule would allow for it, but at the last minute it did not. So I conducted a little interview with the mayor last night and recorded it, and we are going to play it for you here shortly. So Mayor Schwartzman grew up on the East Coast, and he went to college in California. After completing two stints of graduate school, he moved to Galesburg, Illinois in 1998 to launch the Department of Environmental Studies at Knox College. He has published several articles on climate change and energy, and recently co-authored a book on the future of food and energy titled, The Earth is Not for Sale. Having served his city for 10 years as an elderman, a Green Party elderman, he declared his candidacy for mayor and won his election with nearly 47% of the vote. He took office on May 3rd, 2021. And without further ado, we will now play his recording. He's speaking to you all. Please listen to him. He has a really great message for you. So my name is Peter Schwartzman. I've lived in Illinois. Illinois for 23 years, you that? Uh, Western Illinois, the city of Galesburg, about 30,000 people. As far as the Green Party connection, uh, my father has been, uh, David Schwartzman in Washington, D.C., has been a, a very active 
Um, The Green Party connection. Uh, my father has been, uh, David Schwartzman in Washington, D.C., has been a, a very active Green Party person, probably for 30 years, I guess, something like that. So he clearly introduced it to me. Um, and so I became familiar with the, the arguments made and, and, the, and the, the problem with the two party state. You know, there's, there's things that we can work on that are global in nature or national in nature. And then there's things that we obviously can work on Hello? Uh, in a local level. And, and they don't, they, they, they're connected, but they're, they may, they, they, when you present them, they, they might be more, um, more accessible to a community if at the local level. You can speak green without, you know, being ideological, I guess. Right. So in this local camp, I mean, I've I've had four campaigns. Getting on the ballot required, in my case, anywhere when I was running as a counselor, about 30 to 50 signatures of local voters in my community. And then for the mayor's position, it was about 300. And to obtain those signatures, I mean, I would walk door to door talking to people. I think that's definitely the best way to do it. Honestly, I, I didn't, I never saw myself as a politician. I really didn't want to run the first time. Uh, I wanted people to run, and, but I had power of myself, right? And so I said, okay, well, somebody's got to run. And I'll be honest as well, I was uncomfortable running because I was going to have to unseat a female. And, and um, personally, I mean, I teach environmental studies and I, very much recognize the disproportional power that men have in society. And, and I think we would be a much better place if more women were in power. Anyway, so that was, a. I mean, I had to get over that and I had to, you know, I didn't necessarily agree with her policies or her position, but um, I did have some personal challenge there, but I, I decided to run and I unseated her and, and I did so um, by knocking door to door. Um, and I will say that is something I did not want to do. I don't like that. I'm introverted. It, it seems almost uh, a threatening thing. I'm kind of a large guy. And so I had to really dig deep personally to do that work. Um, and I'll, be, I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, Ten years later, when I ran for mayor, I loved knocking on doors. Uh, I woke up every day and it's like, okay, how many doors am I going to knock on today? And I would walk up to every door. I didn't just knock on democratic doors or other doors, you know, that had uh, maybe the grass was a little longer or things like that that might indicate, or they had nice flowers or, you know, or had a Prius in the yard or something. So, I mean, I knocked on every door and frankly, that was powerful because um, people would, you know, I didn't know who was there and they would answer the door and like, what kind of politician are you, you know? And I, I was throwing all kinds of things. I mean, people would ask me, well, do you believe in abortion? And I mean, that's the first question they asked me. And like, well, we could, let's talk about that. But I'm, you know, I'm running for office in this thing, and we're not making decisions on that. Um, another time, a few times I was asked, do I believe in God? And that was an interesting thing, because I, I consider myself an agnostic, but a very spiritual person and very connected to the earth. So that was a really interesting conversation. And I think just having those conversations with the people that you're going to represent really puts you in a good place. Because being a representative, I think this is something I didn't understand, okay, until I was one. Being a representative is, is that. That's what it is, okay? You're not there to forcibly push through your agenda, okay? You may, like, I'm very, I have strong beliefs and I, I, I think the world can be just turned into Shangri-La. I'm basically in Shangri-La right now, by the way. And I'm going back to Galesburg to make it Shangri-La in the near future. But um, it's, you, you have to talk to people and you have to, you have to hear what they're saying. 
because if you don't, and most politicians don't, okay, just in my experience, whether the local level or beyond, they don't. They talk to the people that they're friends with. They, at the higher levels, they probably talk to some kind of think tank that's telling them what messaging to use. And they're not, they're not representing the people. And um, I mean, there are things that are, are not clear importance to me, but if they're important to my community members, I mean, I have to, I have to be able to represent their voice in some way. And just listening to people, particularly after COVID, but even before, is it's hard to believe that we don't listen to people. So becoming a good listener, not being reactive, not being confrontational at all, um, just knocking on the door. I'd have people say, well, I'm not, I don't vote. And I'd say, okay. Um, but I, let me give you a reason to vote this time. And they'd say, well, why should I vote? I said, because I'm a real person. That's why. And I guess I would say in that vein, you, you have to ask yourself, who are you? Right? If you're going to represent people, who are you? And you have to be your genuine self. Because if you're not, and I know this goes against all political wisdom that, that the big policy wants talk about. But I, I'll tell you, we're at a point in time, in, I think, in human history where we need people to be genuine. Now, to someone who's about to run, I would say you can do it. So many people, I, remember, I told you that 10 people didn't come and run. They didn't run, I think, because... I mean, there are lots of reasons, but like they didn't want the responsibility or they were afraid to be in public spotlight. They were afraid to, to have to own the decisions that they made and the positions that they, they, they you know, they uh, espouse. Um, they felt probably that they would have to, they might lose friends over it. Some of the things that, you know, and things like that. But you, you have to, if you want your community to be better, you need people who really care about the community to be in those positions. It's because honestly, most small cities and probably true at the larger city, but I can't speak to that. It is a good old boy network. And it has been probably since the origin of this country. It's a good old boy network. And, and, and those folks, they, I mean, it, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not, they are who they are because of the society we've we created, right? But they are so comfortable in that position that they do not have to walk and talk to people. Uh, they don't have to listen. They don't even have to read the 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 uh, the ordinances. They don't have to read anything. They just come to meetings. They look in our you know many communities. They listen to what the mayor says or listen to what the city manager says. Oh yeah, that sounds good done rubber stamp everything that's 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 partly why i ran because i was just so frustrated with seeing how that was taking place knowing full well that that i didn't want to live in that community right so you have to ask yourself what kind of community you want to live in and then if you don't like the way it's going then you should you've got to step up and and i tell this to people i don't say this too publicly but i was like all in or all out i had gotten to that point because and we can talk about this in a minute, you know, there is so much potential for positive change. All the excuses that are used are just fallacies. They're just fallacies. And I would suspect that when I talk to Green Party people, that's a very unique group of people for a lot of reasons, right? But among them is that they've had enough sense to see through the the nonsense okay and secondly they have enough courage to be different and those those are two critical uh, characteristics of a leader in the modern time right because there is so much nonsense out there and you have to be able to see it and two you have to have the courage to represent something other than the status quo, right? 
So that's why I love third parties and, uh, and the Green Party in particular, because of those, those, you know, those are critical or those are so common. I mean, those characteristics are so common and virtually every green person I've met in my life speaks to the, you know, represents those two characteristics, which again, we need more people like that speaking up in public office, whether it's at the council meeting or if they get elected as the person sitting there, because there is so much noise and so much nonsense and it doesn't get called out. Um, because like, let's be honest, right? People are, they're, they're disempowered. The system disempowers us. You know, most people don't even vote, especially in local elections, because they, and I've heard this, like, why should I vote? It, they're never going to change anything. And I'm like, well, who's they? Because you're talking to they right here. So you tell me what you want and we're going to get it done. I mean, you know, if, if it's reasonable. So, so, and that, just having that conversation, um, I'll tell you when I walked door to door and I had a mask on, right? And I had a, a leaf lit with, you know, with my picture without a mask. Um, people, it took, sometimes it took people a few seconds to realize that was me. Cause they're like, you're walking? Like, oh, hmm. and that alone, that alone, change the whole dynamic of that conversation because I just, I've had people say that I've never spoken to the mayor before. I said, well, you might be speaking to the next mayor. And I didn't say it in an arrogant way. I just said, this is the kind of mayor I'm going to be. So here's my phone number. Call me. If I get elected, call me. You know, and, that, and you can do that at the local level. And, and I've done it up till now. Uh, for the most part, I've answered every phone call that I've gotten. Every request for one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's a lot, okay? Because I'm still full-time teaching, right? So it's a lot to add to my plate. But I can tell you as a human being, and I guess this would be a motivational piece, you will feel so connected to humanity. when you have those conversations. I get a little bit, you know, a little bit verklempt as it were, right? Because it, it's something so human, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very in touch with nature and I have those moments even in class or out in nature, but I think too many humans have not had, or we have too few of those kinds of moments. And it's a really beautiful thing when you can sit down with someone, someone you don't even know, but you live in the same town you, you drink the same water, you, you know, you go to the same stores, your children go to the same schools, you go to the same parks to, to enjoy it. I mean, there's so many common things that you share with these people. There's an identity, right? So in my three previous campaigns, I raised at most probably a thousand dollars. And I probably, most of that came from me or my close relatives. So I didn't have to ask anybody outside of my immediate family for money to run for office. I, at the mayor's race, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I didn't know. Uh, and so I had some folks who had run some major races outside of Galesburg, actually uh, former students of mine who found out I was running and were like, oh, we, we'd like to help you, you know, at least in the thought process. And so they, they said, you got to raise money. And they gave me an, a ballpark and there was a range. And I said, okay, well, I think we can do it for 20. And then I looked, and I just didn't pick a number. I looked at like what I thought we needed, like how many signs do we need? How much publicity do we need? What kind of ads do we need to run? Where do we need to run them? And so $20,000 is my goal. And that was not something I wanted to do. I, I, I just, I just, ew. I just, the calling someone I don't, I mean, someone I know, because you want to call people you know, and in the end, you're, you know you're going to ask them for money. It's just, it just it's something I personally hated to do it. Um, and I, I didn't become comfortable just doing it. I did it only for about a month, thankfully. I was very successful in doing it, I think. Uh, I raised uh, about what I needed. Um, I actually only needed about 15 grand in the end. And that was paying a assistant 
um, real money to work. So that I felt good. At first, we didn't think we was going to be able to pay that person. We went in both saying, well, if we raise enough money, we can pay you, but I, you know, I can't guarantee it. But that, that we pay that person for their time, and I feel very good about that. Um, so 15000 was necessary. I think, I think it, in a way, it, it is something you have to do, um, particularly because, it, it, and, and I hate to say, you know, you're, you're motivated or you're, you're trying to fit in. But it does establish the seriousness of your campaign. It's important to make those calls, and the calls are are not just about the fund is the fund, fundraising, right? It's about getting the word out and showing the confidence you have. See, in my case, and I think this is a case true with especially for first time people, you have to believe you can win. If, if you don't think you can win, it doesn't mean you, you shouldn't run, but you're not gonna probably win, right? You, you have to convince yourself you're gonna win and and not just falsely commit. I mean, and I think, I think this is, we, we may get to the, I think it's really important to surround yourself with people who also believe what you believe, not only that you can win, but that they believe in what you stand for. And those people are as important to you as anything. Cause it's gonna, even in a four month race, there are going to be some ups and downs. There, there are going to be some positive, really positive things you didn't anticipate. And there's going to be some real negative stuff that's going to come at you. But if I have a real message to people in this audience, and I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, you know, for all of us to be there. And I, please invite me next year or whatever. I'd love to come. I mean, I, I to be among such people is so nurturing and so reinvigorating. I love it. So I'm not, you know, I'm there, okay? You don't have to pay for my gas. So anyway, or the train that I take or whatever it is. So the point is, if I have one message to make, it is the following. Um, you have to believe that change can happen. I teach 20 year olds, right? And I'm amazed at how much cynicism they have. And it's, it makes me cry. It really makes me cry. Because if they're cynical at 20, I mean, what are they going to be at 40? Okay. So we, if you are a, it's almost like you're a light bulb. If you're a light bulb in your community for positive thinking about change, that is, you are like a beacon. You, you, you have so much power. And you don't even have to change anything. But you have to be optimistic about the change. And, and I think that we, if we had more of those beacons, and, and I would say Green Party folks have great ideas, but I think sometimes they feel they, their self-doubt a little bit or their self-repression uh, uh, self-criticism, all this stuff stifles their, their flame. So their flame kind of goes like this and they put it out, they hide it behind the, you know, the, 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 the dresser or whatever they do, right? So if you can be a, and, and so when it comes to running for office, of course, you have to believe it. And at the local level, you can win. If you can, if you know someone in your community, like me, and I don't mean me like me, Peter, I just mean somebody who you think is very engaged in the community, has respect in the community, but needs that extra push, that extra support to get them to run for office. It doesn't have to be you, right? But you can be the force that encourages them to do so. And that happened to me as mayor. I had a couple of people who out of the blue, unexpectedly called me and say, look, I think you should run. I'm like, really? Why, why do you think that? And they would tell me, and I was like, wow, I didn't even know you thought that. And, and that gave me, I mean, I don't know if I needed that, but I think it helped in those dark days. It helped to know that there were people who like put me there in that position. And it was very satisfying. But I think if you want to play a role in this, you don't have necessarily to be a person that runs, but I will tell you this, when you get someone elected, 
whomever that is, your friend, your you know colleague, you play as much a role on the other side of the podium as they do. And this is something I guess I should put emphasis on. I'm mayor, okay? But I, but I can't go to the podium and say, okay, we're gonna do this. I, whether you like it or not, it's, it's my idea. I'm the mayor, I got elected, I'm just gonna do it. No, 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 that doesn't work. I mean, this is not a dictatorship that I want, okay? But if someone comes to the mic, an open mic, and says, why don't we have more trees? Trees are good for these 12 reasons. I'm willing to support an effort to put more trees in. And I'm looking at them, I'm like, thank you. Thank you. You know, because now I'm representing them. That's the whole point. As a party, we often focus a lot on national at the national level. And I'm not against that because I think there's a lot of big ideas we need to promote. But how do you translate that down to the local level? And I think that's that's the work that has to be done. But it also is work that anyone in this room listening can do. That's the key. There, there's no one listening to this whatever lecture it's not hopefully not a lecture but this conversation that we're having um everyone can go to the next council meeting and they can share a dream that they have and they'll feel good about doing that and believe it or not there'll probably be two other people that speak at that meeting from the public so they represent one third of the public space and that's power right that's power of influence that's a power of changing the uh mindset of the community but i think i thank you so much i'm so excited to to meet with you talk to you folks i'm so glad you're actually meeting you know i i, I realize behind the scenes everything that you guys are doing that takes a lot of effort takes a lot of faith takes a lot of um like you get back to what i said you know the two things that characteristic of green party folks they 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 are not afraid to 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 think outside the box and they have clarity outside of the status quo and that that's really really important both of those things and and hopefully next year we can gather again and we can discuss all the successes we're having and all and, and share those and and be inspired by those because there's a lot of good stuff going on okay thank you yes, for thank you Bye-bye, guys. That was Mayor Peter Schwartzman. He is, again, the mayor of Galesburg, Illinois. He is a Green Party member, and I'm very, very happy. And I, I thank him on behalf of all of us for taking the time out of his schedule for coming here and talking to us today, um, even though it was a free recording. In the chat, I posted a link to his contact information. He did say, feel free to reach out to him, um, call him, connect with him, especially if you're thinking about running for office, he is willing to talk to you and willing to provide his um, advice. So next up on the agenda, we are going to switch our focus on bylaws and platform changes. I'm going to turn the floor over to Joe Kahn as he is going to lead this section. Joe, the floor is yours. Joe, you're muted. Hi, everyone. Uh, we have on the agenda five different, well, I would say five proposed amendments to the bylaws. Three of them are, are very much related um, to trying uh, to get uh, words in the bylaws to more closely express the idea that we need to be more consensus driven than majority uh, driven organization. And uh, one of them has to do with um, uh, definitions of membership. And then uh, I, I have one as well that uh, I submitted uh, to the to the 
CC a while back, and uh, we, we can deal with that maybe uh, first. And uh, and I think because of the, the way these things are worded, we're going to have to go through them one by one. Um, I would like to, it would be easier to say, to re have readings of all of them and then change them at one with one vote. But I think we should probably vote on them one by one. Uh, if that's okay with everybody else. Um, okay. Uh, the, the one that I presented a while back, uh, it's pretty short. And let me see here. I get the right language. I'll just read it. And it has to deal with electoral political practices and vetting candidates. So there's some discussion about what we need to do to vet statewide uh, candidates. So um, the, the existing language says Green Party candidates for public office selection and standards, uh, candidates for statewide public office shall be uh, selected by the Congress or by the CC. That's the existing language. And that shall be amended as follows. Now, this is the proposed language. Pursuant to the Indiana Green Party candidate vetting procedures as prepared by the Indiana Green Party candidate vetting committee and as amended by that committee from time to time and approved by a majority vote of the CC. Now the candidate vetting committee has been operating independent um, of the, um, uh, well, it has been working on its own to come up with these procedures. What this proposed amendment would do is instead of like spelling out exactly how candidates are to be vetted in, in the bylaws, it throws off that authority to this uh, vetting procedures uh, committee and the, the processes that can be voted on um, by the CC and change from time to time because it's hard, much harder and the rationale for that is, is it's much harder and more cumbersome to amend the bylaws than it would be to, to uh, create uh, vetting procedures that we can grow with and adapt to current circumstances um, and, and it's much less cumbersome. Uh, Robert's rules calls for this sort of tiered uh, organizational thing so we're not doing any, and, and many organizations do it this way. Uh, so the proposal is, is to uh, create this mechanism on the side of the bylaws that would create vetting procedures for candidates. And the bylaws would give that, that process authority and power, basically, of the organization to go ahead and do that. And that the, the approval of this, uh, the, these procedures would be rested in the hands of the, of the coordinating committee. So uh, I propose this has been submitted to the CC. Um, my recollection is uh, accepted by them. So um, if, if, um, if there's any discussion on, on this or questions about it, let, let's do it now. Anyone? Okay. So uh, then, and I'm since I'm chairing this thing, I should probably I shouldn't make even though it's it's language that I wrote. This really isn't my amendment, except that I wrote the language to it. Uh, it was something that came out of uh, earlier CC meeting conversations, and I was uh, I volunteered to draft it uh, to try and meet what I think the CC consensus was on what we wanted to do. Um, so I would uh, entertain a motion to approve. Um, Joe, I've got to, we, we actually have this on the ballot as uh, an option with our officers, the electronic ballot that everybody was emailed um, and voting is still open on okay. that. If, if you have voted, you should have received an email um, with your votes and you do have the option still to go in there and there's a button to change your vote. So if anything that's said here okay. uh, convinces you otherwise, you can go in there and you can change your vote at any time. Very good. I, I have not received that. So uh, I, I, I stand corrected. Thank you, Adam. So anyway, there's the procedure for voting. Um, so uh, 
any other discussion on this then and then we can move on to the next one um, seeing and hearing none um, the second bylaw it was uh, proposal was submitted by uh, Adam and it, it uh, talks about membership definitions Adam I, I think I do you have your copy in front of you or um, do you want to explain what the intent was and then I could probably read your copy if you need to. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, what this proposal will do um, is uh, it changes the definition of an a, a Indian and Green Party member a little bit. Um, and what we're doing is, is we're setting some um, qualifications. This is largely based off of what Illinois requires. Um, so uh, one of the changes would be to be uh, a voting member um, in the Indiana Green Party. Um, you have to be at least 13 years of age and you have to be an Indiana resident um, that we verify then through the Indiana voter registration database. Um, so as it is right now, um, anybody can sign up and be a member. They can live anywhere in the world. There's absolutely no verification process at all on who these people are. Um, so we're just trying to um, bring some accountability to uh, the party and uh, make sure that the people that are in the party are in fact Indiana residents. And again, this is based off of what Illinois does. So we're not just really pulling this out of a hat. Um, and then this requirement can be waived for special circumstances by the CC. Um, so it's not kind of an all or nothing if there is, you know, uh, a, a, a reason to have a voting member that lives outside of Indiana, um, the CC can look at that and say, oh yeah, this can be a voting member. And then for people that don't qualify, this is already in there, um, they can still be members, but they're not uh, voting members. So you can still support the party and uh, come to meetings and, and you'll be heard, but when it comes to voting time, you have to actually qualify um, as it is spelled out in, in the bylaws now. And that's, those are the the differences. Um, oh, and then there's also an automatic removal. So um, you'll be removed from the membership list um, when the party receives notice that you're no longer a resident of Indiana, or if uh, the person becomes a member or uh, becomes an officer or a candidate of another statewide party. So obviously, if we have a, a Democrat or a Republican running for office, they can't be a member of the Indiana Green Party. Um, and that language is included in here as well. So that is for um, proposal B, uh, membership definitions. Back, uh, back to you, okay. Joe. Thank you, Adam. Is there any discussion on, on what's proposed? Any discussion on what's proposed? Any objections? Any uh, request for clarification? Okay, hearing and seeing none. Um, let's move on to the, the next proposed amendment. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, the third proposed amendment is by David Wetterer, and it has to do with consensus. The next next three of these by David, uh, Terry, and Michael Cooper all have to do with with consensus. Uh, just, I, I did a quick search find. Uh, our, our current bylaws mention the word consensus five times. So um, we have procedures in there uh, for consensus and, and, and there's several proposals here that uh, would amend the existing language and, and the third one by Mike would create a process by which we could more formalize um, how we go about what should be done to go about getting a uh, consensus. And there's a model out there that Michael has suggested that we might wanna uh, at least look at for guidance. But uh, the first one is by David. And uh, David, do you have a copy of it in front of you or do you uh, want to just go, and go ahead and just explain uh, what it is you're, the gist of what it is you're proposing and why? Most definitely. Thank you, Joe. Um, so as some of you may or may not know, uh, and as others of you may or may not find out, um, reaching a decision on the CC is incredibly difficult on uh, a number of matters. 
um, it, it's a it's a large group or body, and um, you know the existing rules as they're written um, forces you to pass things via a majority of that body, and uh, so currently the size is 15, and you know you need to have eight in the affirmative in order for a motion to carry. Um, what I'm trying to do is gently tweak how the rules are, you know, working currently, um, so that um, it helps flow decision making a little bit easier. Um, so the problem with the current model is that. Um, you can vote either yes, no, or abstain on anything. And <clears throat> you still have to get eight yeses in order to pass something, whether somebody says abstain or no, you know, and not offering like, you know, any kind of constructive feedback or anything like that. Um, you know, it, it essentially counts as a no because it's not a yay vote uh, in the affirmative. So what I tried to do by adding a simple sentence to, you know, kind of redefine what abstain means, and I think it, you know, refocuses on the true definition of abstaining, um, you know, which is a refusal to vote. Uh, I think if someone refuses to vote, then their vote shouldn't be calculated into the majority. And what this does is enables us to remove anyone who abstains from the tabulation in the majority. Um, you, you say two people abstain, you know, and seven people vote for the affirmative, uh, and then the rest are voting for no. At this point, you know, you can remove those two people from the calculation of the majority. And you ne instead need a calculation uh, or a tabulation of seven yays in order to pass the motion, because you're not considering whoever abstains refusing to vote. You're not considering their vote as you know given any weight on the matter. Um, so I thought of this as, as a way, you know, a present to whoever's on the next CC to get things through a little bit easier. Uh, it also picks up on, you know, abstentions via email because a lot of stuff's done via email as well. Um, it doesn't carry this tabulation all the way over to email. It only specifically limits it to the CC meetings, but you can always expand it later if you want. I thought it was a good way to improve the current model. And, um, you know, I encourage you to vote for it moving forward. Thank you, I appreciate it. Let's see if I can under get my head wrapped around this. What you would propose is, is that that if um, you have, let's say, 11 members of the CC show up, then uh, you would need uh, six affirmative votes to pass something. Uh, is that correct so far? Um. No, so the only thing that changes is how you tabulate the abstentions. Um, so no matter the size of the CC, currently okay. our CC is at 15. Um, you know, you need a, a majority, which is, you know, eight, you know, in order to pass a motion. And, you know, if it's 11, and then you need a majority of six. Uh, you know, either way, no matter the size, you need a majority plus, you know, a rounded up. Um, but how you tabulate that majority, okay? Um, you know, if say, you know, every, you don't add and subtract people from the CC all that often, okay? We had 15 carried through, right. you know, the whole of the year. But, you know, say you have 100% attendance, okay, theoretically, we all know that doesn't happen, but yeah, you know, everybody shows up, you know, it, you know, the chair only votes in the event of a tie, and, you know, you need eight to carry a motion forward with a, a whole of 15. Um, so, but say like two people abstain, okay, and everybody else votes no, so it's seven, 
two, six, seven, six, two. Okay. Seven, you know, yays, six no's, and two abstains. Okay. Mm -hmm. We remove those two abstains. Okay. Because those people refuse to vote, which is what the true definition of abstain is. If you look it up, a refusal to vote, okay. you know, if you refuse to vote, then either yes or no, then your vote shouldn't be counted at all is what I'm trying to say. So we're gonna remove from the votes needed, the calculation of the abstention or the calculation of that, instead of eight for that time, we're gonna remove those two people right, so you're, you're, you're... to 13 for a majority of seven. So seven would then pass whatever that motion is. So a seven six majority then would pass. And uh, correct. That correct. Gotcha. Your, your language is abstention shall not be counted as participating for that specific vote. So that's that deals with what you just described. Okay. That was the best way so to that, sum that, everything that, I just set up. Yes. Right. I, I think I understand what you're trying to do with this now. And so I, I think that language would be fine as long as the record is here uh, in, the, in the Congress of, of that explanation. Uh, it's probably fine standing on its own as well. But I just to be clear to everybody here uh, what, what the intention was. I wanted to explain what your goal was. And, and, uh, and I think the language matches your, that goal. All, all right. Uh, anything else, uh, David, that you want to explain or talk about with this uh no i i believe i have spoken about it uh well enough at this point unless there's questions about okay it. all right i have uh, all right concern. so i will throw it open for questioning yes um who's who and abstain vote hand raised <clears throat> yes. speaking uh sky will Okay, An abstained vote is somewhat similar to a none of the above, uh, <clears throat> which indicates that that's not a um, uh, an approved choice. So I think the abstained votes are, are it's a non-vote, it's rather important though, it would be the same, along the same lines as uh, uh, none of the above on voting. Joe, do you see Adam's hand is up? Sky Wolf, you broke up a little bit. Oh, let me repeat. Um, the abstained vote is somebody who doesn't take that, uh, who doesn't like either position. And that's similar to the concept of uh, none of the above in voting. Therefore, I think it, uh, you know, I, I think we uh, need to think this through a little bit more. Okay, uh, Skywell, thank you for that. Adam, you have your hand raised. Let me unmute here. I do have a, a slight concern with this language um, because I do think it could be taken ad advantage of. So say um, an, an abstination would also include uh, people who cannot make the meeting um, and then people obviously who are not voting on the meeting. So um, if the CC has, let's say 13 people as it does now, Current language, I believe, means you need um, seven to have a majority, and it has to be seven eyes no matter what. Um, with this language, if only seven people are in the meeting, um, everybody absent will be abstaining. Um, so that means that you would only need four uh, votes to get something to pass. And then if you have, say, three people in the meeting abstain, um, then there's only, uh, you know, if there's, if there's only three people voting, then two people voting can pass something in the CC board um, with this language. And to me, that's concerning because then people can schedule meetings knowing when people cannot make a meeting and they can use that to an advantage to pass something through that might be kind of controversial with uh, the rest of the board. That's my concern here. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, let me give David, uh, who proposed this uh, thing, uh, a chance to respond. David, do you have any comments to Adam's concern? Um, you know, I think there might be, um, a way to amend it, to make it better, but, you know, 
I didn't think of that. Um, but, you know. Okay. Cassidy Stack? Cassidy, go ahead. Um, David, would you be partial in a, approving a friendly amendment um, to clarify that quorum is still required of a majority of the CC members? Uh, I would be okay with that. Okay. I, I believe that, um, I don't know how electronically, Adam, we're gonna be able to, to uh, deal with amendments to the, uh, to the uh, proposals. I'm just going off the top of my head right here that um, I think the Congress can go ahead and improve changes to the bylaws during the Congress if there's a 75% approval of the members attending the Congress. It, it, you, I see Terry, you're nodding. You think that's correct? Um, so, uh, but I don't know how we have, uh, what kind of mechanism we could have to do that. I see your hands up, Adam, go ahead. You, you're muted. Yeah, um, regarding the quorum, I believe that's already the case. Um, but the problem is if you have a quorum and it's just one above quorum, um, then everybody else would be abstaining, which means that, so if quorum is seven, then still something would only need four votes to pass if the, if the CC has 13 people on it. Um, so I, I, I don't think that, that adding that language will actually change anything. Okay. Well, if nothing else, let me take this moment to say abstaining effectively means no, you're not getting your motion passed and be ready for that as you go into the CC because it's going to happen quite often and perhaps one of you can craft a better sounding bylaw in order to get it passed at the next meeting next year. Yeah. Having had my opportunities to uh, write bylaws, uh, it, it can be a tricky business. And, and it's a good thing to have many eyeballs and minds working on bylaws because, especially ours, <laughs> they can, they're, they're so intertwined that it's, uh, it's sometimes you don't know what, what's going to come out even if you think you thought it all through. So, okay, well, there, there's David's, David, do you have any other final words or anything on, on your proposal? Um, no, um, just that I don't really like the other two either. So, <laughs> okay, but go ahead. Well, well said. All right. Uh, the, uh, second proposed amendment that deals with, um, <clears throat> voting processes, I guess you could call it, and, and it, it actually is consensus is by Terry and, um, I'll, I'll let you talk on that. Terry, go ahead. Tell us what you hope to do by this and, and how you um, think it'll do it. Absolutely. So um, I went ahead and revised the bylaw that we just talked about, um, but I did it a different way. Um, if, uh, it was available to everyone. I'm going to read it. Uh, it's currently the bylaw says this. This is Article 4, Leadership, Section 61F. The CC shall attempt to reach consensus on all decisions. When consensus, consensus cannot be reached, members of the CC shall vote. And I recommend striking the following sentence. A majority of the CC members must vote in favor of a decision for it to pass. And I'm adding the following language for more clarification. A, at the CC meetings, the majority of the total CC members must vote in favor of a decision to pass. So even if a portion of the CC members come to the meeting, it has to be the majority of all CC members, even the ones that aren't there in order for something to pass. And then I'm adding also B, and this is for housekeeping when we're taking uh, uh, votes by email. Um, for votes cast by email, the majority of the CC members must vote in favor of the decision for it to pass and votes are counted as abstentions after 48 hours. And so my, my proposal basically 
ensures that nothing happens unless the majority of the people on the CC is for it. Thank you. Okay. So this is a, an interesting difference of opinion. David would like to make it easier for the CC. I, if I could just, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think I understand your proposal and eliminate the, the, the difficulty in getting things passed because you have to have a majority of, of, of um, people on the CC, uh, whether they're voting in, with abstaining or not. Um, and Terry, you want to make, if I could, if I, my, I'm understanding it correctly, your proposal would make it more difficult to pass something from the CC because you'd have to have um, have to have those those people. You have to have a majority of the entire body of the CC, whether they vote, whether they show up at the meeting or not. Is, is that a fair um, summary? Yes and no. I believe that's how the CC is currently functioning. So I don't think it would uh -huh. make it more difficult. Um, so, um, I, so and then clarifying? I also think it'll make it easier by laying out how to handle these email votes because a lot of yeah. times a vote will be called and then people just don't respond. So it's like wrapping that email vote up. So I would argue that this would make the job easier. David Stack. Okay. Um, so okay. fair enough. I'll go ahead. Um, um, let's um, open this for discussion. Go ahead, David. Yes. Um, David, go ahead. Do so I, uh, I I interpreted uh, Terry's um, submission of this proposal to effectively be a um uh, a rewriting of the current bylaws uh, and basically cementing how they are currently uh rephrasing it to effectively mean the same thing um just uh that's that's what i took it as um you know but uh you know my opinion is that it's already too hard and i'm trying to make it easier i don't know how her rephrasing it's you know proposal is going to make it easier. I would be welcome to hearing how it should make things easier to move things forward, but um, I don't think it effectively changes anything. Okay. Terry, I think you kind of answered that question, but go ahead if you want to respond. Um, sure, let me pull up it again. Um, so I don't think passing things by a minority will be easy well that'll definitely be easy but will it be good for the party is it what the members want so i give caution to everybody of leaving the decision making in the minority of people um especially when there's such uh, a spectrum of views and and this and and thoughts i don't think a small group of people should be deciding for all of us it should be all of us from all the different caucuses and groups and the majority of that is what the Indiana Greens party stands for. I, I don't have anything else to add. Okay, well, thank you, Terry. I'll open it up to further discussion uh, at the Congress. Anyone else want to uh, have a, you know, express an opinion on, on these, these two uh, differences of opinion? Let's put it that way. Hearing none and seeing none, I wanna move on to the third and final uh, proposal, and this is by uh, Michael Cooper. And what he, uh, well, Mike, let me just go ahead and let you talk about what it is you proposed, um, and and we can discuss it a little bit okay. later. Thank you, Joe. Um, a couple, several months ago, this the CC had a. Um, uh, information session uh, with a, a person who gave a, a, a discussion about the consensus, uh, the different types of um, decision making models. Uh, currently, we use uh, for our decisions, uh, we, we mentioned consensus in the bylaws, but our structure is really based upon uh, Robert's rules of order uh, as our default. Um, building on kind of discussion from that CC and the fact that, uh, you know, I've been involved with other state states that have a more uh, structured consensus process. 
with with the way they make decisions. Um, I was looking at uh, changing the bylaws to kind of open up the gate for the CC to create a rules procedure around how we understand consensus uh, or the model that we're going to be following. Um, and that you know that we can come up with a creative and dynamic way for, for reaching agreement uh, in, in the group. Uh, and uh, there's, I think, some confusion about the consensus model. Um, it is one in which uh, it allows for, uh, one of the things it does, it, it focuses on trying to get everyone to agree on something different than kind of Robert's rules where you make a motion and people put amendments and they vote amendments and someone puts another amendment up and they vote on amendments. This is kind of fleshing out the issues in the front, giving the people who have uh, varying degrees of concerns, um, the ability to kind of to speak and to uh, address any of those concerns and kind of shape the issue, shape the uh, proposal uh, in a way that is, is, is more open for more voices. Uh, and it gives people an opportunity to express if they have any blocks or if they have any stand asides, uh, any reservations and, and kind of creates a pathway to consensus. So basically what this bylaw procedure this bylaw proposal does is, is kind of opens up that door uh, for creating that document. Uh, it doesn't specify exactly how that's going to be. That's going to be, uh, as a consensus model, it's up to kind of the group to make up how they're going to do consensus. Uh, but it kind of opens up that door uh, for the ability for at least the CC uh, and the Congress uh, to kind of focus on, on doing that consensus model in a very process and documented kind of way. Uh, there's more information about, I mean, if you haven't been familiar with the consensus model, you can just okay. look up uh, the consensus uh, model for decision-making. Uh, many uh, grassroots organizations, including the, the Green Party, uh, several Green Parties uh, follow that uh, process. Uh, the American Heart Association has, has a nice two-page flyer probably because Robert's Rules is probably one of the leading causes of heart attacks uh, among organizations. Uh, so uh, do, uh, do take a chance to look at those documents. But this is, it doesn't specify any particular thing. It just uh, allows the CC to create a rules procedure. Uh, and if it doesn't have a rules procedure, you know, it just defaults back to Robert's Rules. Okay. Uh, any discussion uh, or questions for Michael on his proposal? Any questions or discussions for Michael on his proposal? I, I have, I have, Michael and I have discussed this prior, to, in fact, this morning we were on the phone together prior to this meeting. And I guess my one concern is, and we, we, I, I think we pretty well addressed it, but my concern is, is uh, as, as, as nasty as Robert rules of order are, and you know, I've got a 500 page version of um, Robert's rules in front of me. And um, here's, the, here's the 500 page version. And here's the uh, short book and it's, and this is the Robert's Rules for Dummies like me, and this is 170 pages. Uh, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> they've been, you have to give them at least credit for having tried to think through every single possible conceivable permutation of assholeism on earth, you know, and, and try to put a stop to it. <clears throat> so, um, I, I guess the question that I, that, that I, Michael and I wrestled with, and I'll just bring this up, um, was what we have here is in, in the beginning of it, we strike um, uh, the provisions how says that a reference on standard procedure for conducting this shall be uh, by Robert's rules of order. And then uh, we go back down below and, and, and then says when the consensus model procedure for consensus decision making is not adopted or is repealed, then Robert's rule of order shall be used. So I guess I'm having talked with Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of okay with that, but I just don't want to get our organization untethered from 
excuse me, I had this thing drop out, untethered from some sort of rules of order until we actually know where we're going to land, you know. Um, so I, I'm, I'm satisfied, I guess, that uh, what we have here, the length that we have here is, is would, would be suitable because we have this position where, you know, if, if this consensus model doesn't come out of the CC process, um, <laughs> And, and I, I read that to be as up and up until it does come out of the CC process, we still have something to guide us. So uh, that that's my take on it. But anyway, Mike, if you disagree with that, uh, and you may very well uh, j jump right in. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, what kind of what I talked to you about earlier is that uh, with consensus model, um, kind of you're moving to the front the discussion. Uh, in the Roberts Rules of Order, nothing can happen until there's a motion. Uh, and then you kind of, pro you tr there's procedures for dealing with that motion and how you can amend it and things like that. Uh, with consensus model, you kind of, before you formulate your final thing that's up for a vote, uh, you go through a very detailed process of kind of what, how can we make this better before we present it? Uh, which is uh, kind of, different than Robert's rules of order is like, you just throw something out there and then we try to fix it. Okay. Well, so we have that. Any further discussion on Michael's motion? Any further discussion on any of the five amendments? Something just struck you odd just recently. No? Okay. So my understanding is we have a procedure uh, to vote on all of these things. And uh, I think, Terry, if you've got anything else for me, uh, Catherine, for me, uh, let me know. But I think my job's done here. Yes, thank you very much, Joe. Thank you for taking a lead on this and uh, doing such a great job. It's greatly appreciated. Um, so now we are, we are a bit behind in our schedule, but I think we'll make up time in this next section just due to some people not being able to make it today and not here to uh, introduce themselves. But now we are going to move on to one of the most exciting parts of this meeting, and that is the forum with the Coordinating Committee Officer and National Committee Delegate nominees. So we're first going to address the chair position. Um, Byron is unfortunately not able to make it today. Um, he did gather some materials. I just put a link in the doc in the chat here that he would like you to go over and while considering him um, for this position. Um, Orletta Holmes is also on your ballot. She was unable to make it today and was not able to get materials for you to review. Um, and next we have John from the Disability Caucus. He is the chair of the caucus and the delegate. Uh, he's going to take the floor right now and introduce himself and just give you um, a little spiel of why you think why he thinks you should vote for him for chair. John, you have the floor. And you're muted. Go ahead and unmute yourself. That would be important. Thank you, Terry. All right, I think I know pretty much everybody. If I haven't met you already, hello. Um, my name is John T. Shear. I'm in Bloomington, Indiana. And as Terry mentioned, I am the, the chair and the delegate for the Disabilities Caucus. Um, I, all I can tell you about myself is, is that I have been present and active on the CC over this last year. Um, to me, my vision for the party going forward, it, it is slightly different than some of our other members on the CC. We do have more of a, some more conservative members and we're not on the CC. For me though, I think our strength is to provide Indiana with a leftist alternative, something more in line with the national Green Party US policies. Um, and protocols. So to that end, I think that branding is going to be really important for the Indiana Green Party and that we need to get on brand with the National Green Party. Uh, I, I feel like we have a good opening right now in Indiana to push some more kind of leftist or progressive ideas and agendas in the state house and, and work with whatever Republicans and Democrats that we can uh, until we start getting our, our candidates up and running. Uh, obviously, this being the Green Party now, we should be pushing for environmental issues. Um, so obviously, you know, we don't want to only talk about transitioning to green energy, but, but also making some of those components 
uh, here in Indiana. So as you're driving down the highways, you see all the windmill turbines, you see all the solar panels that are being installed or have been installed. But where are those things being made? I don't think any of that is being made within the state. So are we able to pressure Democrats and Republicans in the state house to make 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 Indiana a place where we can start making these components? Could those jobs be union jobs even? That would be amazing, right? So I would love to focus on some of that with our party pushing Republicans and Democrats in that direction. Um, aside from that, uh, you know, again, I just want to continue on, on the work. I've learned a great deal over the last year uh, from, from our interim chair, Terry, and, 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 and of course, uh, Chairman Brand, when he was still involved, I learned quite a lot from both of them over the last year. And I want to continue, continue to learn what I can about the party and how to affect change within the state. And, and that's really, that's my spiel, I guess, right? Great, thank you, John. Sure, sure. So next up, next up we are going to have uh, the candidates for the assistant chair uh, go ahead and take the floor, introduce themselves and tell you why they would be the best person to be in this position. So first up, we have Brianna Baker. She is a former national delegate for the Indiana Green Party. Bri, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Hi. So I actually agree with what was just said that I think it is important to try to look at what national is doing. It doesn't always mean that we have to follow strictly exactly, um, you know, like the Green Party. We do think about the fact that decisions can be made on smaller levels too. Um, and also decisions that are made on smaller levels can affect on bigger levels as well. Um, so yeah, it's really good for us to look at what National is doing and try to brand as well. Um, and also just try to look at what can we start doing here in Indiana right now? So whether that be green energy, like zero waste, uh, just trying to find ways that we can impact our local communities more. Um, yeah, and I think just getting involved in things like community gardens, anything that we can possibly do, trash cleanups, um, I have been away for quite some time, uh, people might know. I um, actually traveled to another country for medical treatment and I now use a wheelchair full time. Um, I'm currently in Bloomington, Indiana. And so I have had quite a bit of struggle in life recently, but luckily it's, it's starting to get a bit better. And I, I think just having that perspective of going to another country and seeing all the different in transportation, how clean it was, how great the medical system was, it makes me want change here even more. Because I, I felt like I got to experience that freedom that we all think America should be, but it wasn't here, so. Great, thank you, Bree. Uh, next up for uh, assistant chair position is Cassidy. She is our current communications director. Cassidy, can you go ahead and take the floor and let everyone know uh, who you are and why you want this position? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, I believe I know most people on this call or I've communicated with you in some shape or form, or you've probably seen my emails. Uh, since I became communications director last year in August, Indiana Green Party has seen a lot of growth, uh, but I can see us growing so much more. Uh, one of the things that we have started doing since you know the pandemic has released a lot of the protocols with getting a lot of people vaccinated. I'm in Marion County, so I'm also part of the our local. Uh, we've been doing some events that I wanna see the state level also help push our locals to do. Um, I spearheaded the trash cl cleanup um, at a local park. We had a great turnout and we filled an entire U-Haul truck with trash. Uh, and I think those community events are really important going forward. Um, also, a specific thing that I'd like to see our state do is more interaction with our volunteers. Um, and one way I think we can do that is actually attending, uh, what, what are they called? Like the festivals and things like that, um, that each county has. I'm from rural Indiana. So we just actually had our, our um, like summer festival and I went there and I talked to a few people about Green Party. And surprisingly, there's tons of people in my area that support what we stand for, except they had never heard of us. 
Um, so I think these like tabling opportunities and just getting out in the community will be huge for us going forward. Um, and I have been involved nationally as well, um, really keeping in contact with nationals as our communications director um, this past year. And I think that will be paramount going forward. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on nationally that does affect us. And I believe Indiana should have a voice in. Um, if you ever have any questions, feel free to text, email, or even DM me in the chat, I will respond. Thank you. Thank you, Cassidy. Um, and just to respect everybody's time, we're going to skip ahead in the agenda. We are going to come back to this and introduce the remaining nominees. Uh, but at 2.30, we have a new presentation to give. Um, I just want to know, can anyone in here tell me how many wars we're at right now? How many wars we're involved in? Yeah, you can't answer it because the definition of war is mucky and Congress has not declared war since 1942, but yet our tax dollars are, are destroying people's country or people's countries all around the world. They're, they're, we are everywhere. We are everywhere. We're in everybody's country. We're in everybody's backyard. You may not think of war because we live in this in this country and in Indiana, we don't have to worry about bombs coming down on us, but we're dropping them on people. So I and the Green Party speaks for peace and we call for an end of war. So we invited Code Pink today to come and speak to us and talk to us about how we can get involved and get call for an end of war. Um, so I am going to now introduce Dana Kane from the Code Peak, um, from the Cone Peak organization. She is the engagement manager. Shanna. Hi, thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you, Terry, for inviting me. I'll just be talking about some volunteer opportunities and kind of what Code Pink stands for. Um, so yeah, as Terry was mentioning, um, Code Pink, we are a woman-led woman grassroots social justice organization. So our main goal is to um, end all wars, all occupations um, across the world and to redirect all that money into a more peaceful economy. So for example, we spend about $778 billion on the US military every year. And this money could be going into, you know, the U.S. economy um, to end, to provide, you know, universal health care, to um, abolish student loans, um, to uh, abolish homelessness, et cetera. So um, that's what we uh, that's what our um, that's what our organization works for. So um, in terms of um, volunteer opportunities, we have quite a bit of volunteer opportunities. It, it depends on what you want to do. So um, we have some um, more like entry level volunteer opportunities like note taking, petition promotion, um, translation into different um, languages, especially Spanish, Chinese, um, Pashto and Farsi um, is what we're really looking for. Um, publishing articles related to um, the US foreign policy on our pink tank blogs um, and also helping out with a lot of our social media um, accounts and um, to kind of engage and to push our, out our information more. And we also have, I'm gonna drop in the chat our campaigns. Um, oops. Yeah, if you wanna engage in like research, um, writing, advocacy, or organizing, then please check out these campaigns um, and I can connect you and I'm gonna put my, um, my email in the chat as well. Yeah, if, you, um, if you're interested in this, then for example, if you're interested in like climate change, then um, we can connect you with the local peace economy to be working on that. If you're interested in um, feminism, then we can connect you with uh, feminist foreign policy, um, et cetera. So um, yeah, please let me know if you are interested in any of our campaigns and then we can um, go from there. Great, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. I encourage everybody to act. Um, like I said, we are very fortunate to not have bombs dropping down on us, but we are paying for them. Um, so we have a duty within ourselves to try to stop this and not let um, our way of life be somebody else's burden. Um, so we are going to go back and just introduce some of the National Committee delegates. Uh, we are behind schedule here, so I ask that you just keep it brief. I will go ahead and post your um, bios and the information you gave me into the chat so people can see it. Uh, first up, I'm going to have Sarah Dillon take the floor. She is a current National Committee delegate. 
She is our fundraising chair and the Vigo County Green Party representative. Sarah, the floor is yours. Hi there. Um, thank you so very much. Um, my name is Sarah Dillon. I am from Terre Haute, Indiana. I've been a long time Green Party activist since like 2005. Um, I've also been on the National Committee on and off since like 2007. I'm one of the two present National Committee delegates. Um, more of my information is in the chat right now. Uh, thanks, Terry. Um, basically, I, I also work on the GPUS fundraising committee, and I've worked with I've worked with people from the like Howie Hawkins campaign uh, this past year, um, and a lot of other stuff. You can see it in the biography, and some of the things that I want to push for, um, basically, um, is. Uh, trying to get like a fundraising plan for, because I'm on the GPUS fundraising committee, along with the Indiana Green Parties, uh, try to get uh, some funding from them in regards to like ballot access and uh, trying to push a fundraising plan similar to what we worked on earlier this year with our fundraising committee and uh, do a, like a more start to organize a strategic plan uh, with the national committee. And that's pretty much it. Keep, like I said, I'll keep it brief. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so next up for this position of national delegate is Jacob Peterson. I'm throwing in the chat right now his materials that he provided for everyone to review in prior to considering him for the position. Jacob, the floor is yours. All righty, thank you very much. Uh, hey guys, I'm uh, Jacob Peterson. I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, I guess a little bit about myself, how I got into the Green Party. Um, I first got into the Green Party. I was a music student at the time. I was a French horn player. And uh, I saw George Wolfe running for Secretary of State as a, you know, him being, being a famous saxophone player in this uh, state. And I was like, holy crap, that's awesome. A musician running for public office. So that kind of got me introduced to the Green Party. And then... Uh, a year afterwards, I officially became a member of the Green Party after seeing after being extremely disappointed by uh, the DNC choosing uh, Joe Biden and just kind of realizing I just need to give up on them and just like as a true leftist actually join a legitimate leftist party. Um, um, so I've been so I've been a member for a year. Um, I was kind of encouraged by some members to uh, run for this particular uh, uh, position this year. Um, uh, some things that, um, if you read my platform, some of the things I kind of want to focus on, uh, one of the things that I was really encouraged by Howie Hawkins' campaign was that he co-nominated himself with the Socialist Party, as well as, I believe, the Socialist Alternative Party. And I think, um, as a national delegate, I really want to encourage us to push towards um, kind of having more of a platform that's more open, more of an open tent to encourage that kind of a diversity of kind of within the leftist spectrum, because, you know, let's be honest, I guess leftists can be kind of, we can tend to, tend to be purists in a way. So that's why we have so many leftist parties and we're kind of divided at this point. So I kind of think that's important for us to see how we can get as many as underneath our tent as possible. Uh, secondly, I think in regards to campaign strategies, um, I think we definitely have lost some ground in regards to some offices. I know in Indiana, um, specifically in Allen County, I was looking at our results and there was actually um, two townships where we could have ran uh, candidates in that spot and automatically won because in townships, for township boards, you could have the up to three members run. And in these elections, only one person was running. So had we just put up people and gotten the nominations, gotten, the, gotten them nominated onto the ballot, um, we would have automatically won. So I think we need to, as nationally, look at more local elections more seriously and see what we can do and find those opportunities like that where we can actually actually just win elections just by default like that. Um, uh, finally, um, something that uh, I did not know coming into this, um, unfortunately we have a um, anti-transgender issue that has been popping up and uh, specifically I believe the Georgia State Party. Um, 
I think it's unfortunate um, that some of our members, uh, specifically one of our national delegates, approved of this kind of behavior. Um, I just want to make it clear that I believe that as a leftist party, we can't claim to be a better leftist alternative to the Democratic Party if we're not recognizing the dignity and respect for all people, regardless of your background. And I want to make it clear that a vote for me is a vote for and a strong supporter as for the transgender community. And I think it's very clear that we need to make it clear that to be a leader in this party means that unequivocally that you need to support every single community and their basic rights and not play lame, not be neutral, try to ignore, you know, any form of bigotry. That's, that's the line right there. We can, we can disagree on small little frivolous stuff, but we can't disagree on the identities of human beings. So all in all, that's kind of my platform where I'm coming from. And um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Jacob. Um, so next up is Jeff Sutter. And I am pasting in the chat right here information that he gathered for everybody to review while you consider voting for him. Uh, Jeff Sutter is the founding member of the Green Party of the United States. He's a founding member of the Indiana Green Party. He's a current National Committee delegate. And up until yesterday, I had no idea that he has design credit for the pride for the pride flag that he that he did a year before I was born in 1979, fighting for those rights. Jeff, you have the floor. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, that question already came up. I don't want to overclaim. I knew and uh, loved Gilbert Baker. He uh, tried to make, uh, he made flags with us at Paramount Flag Company in San Francisco. He, he didn't have access to, uh, to good flag bunting that was uh, weather resistant. And uh, so we made, we made the giant flags that flew at City Hall. We made the banners down uh, Market Street for the Pride Parade. Um, and my only contribution was figuring out that six stripes was fantastic and would be easiest for people to make, was simple and was beautiful. And so it became one of the biggest versions. Uh, you know, there's seven stripes, there's all kinds of versions, but, um, uh, but yeah, those were, those were the days. Um, I'm now in South Bend. Uh, I was active in the Greens in uh, Missouri. Uh, uh, here in Indiana, back in the 2000s during the Nader campaign, uh, you know, we, were, we had the campaign going and the local and uh, South Bend helped uh, pull people together in Indiana to start the party. Uh, I'm, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot more in the, the history that, that uh, Terry posted. Um, I'm trained in political science. Uh, I work at a domestic violence shelter here in town now, not, not directly with the clients. Um, there are a lot of positive things happening in South Bend. Uh, uh, for me, the, the spirit of Peter Schwartzman was really uh, fantastic. And that's the kind of thing that we, that we need. Um, uh, that's, that's kind of the uh, key thing I think I'd like to, to point to there. Um, regarding the National Committee, uh, I've said this before, you know, on an annual basis, practically. Um, the National Committee is uh, probably the least relevant uh, place to be if you want to work on Indiana politics. Um, you know, one of the biggest discussions lately, uh, there's been an argument about anti-vax uh, and, and vaccination politics. Uh, it's not helpful. Um, wanting to change the Green Party really involves working in Green Party committees, you know, the active committees like uh, uh, the, uh, the fundraising committee, uh, as Sarah's doing, uh, specific issue area committees, or really more importantly, here in the state. So people uh, with an energy to create new things for the, the Green Party, both in the state and nationally, should be working, uh, those who have energy for organizing here in the state. Um, uh, a couple of 
couple of there were a couple of mentions of branding, better branding. Um, uh, I had a long career in market research, uh, and branding is a word that means a number of things, but it means targeting messages to people and crafting those messages. And so better branding means nothing really, I think, politically. One needs to actually talk about what issues are involved, um, how, to, how to message them, how to deal with them, how to actually embody them, and uh, how to convince people about them. And, and how, when you do that, whom are you talking to? Whom are you targeting? And, you know, there have been kind of mixed messages. Uh, we, wanna, we wanna bring the left together and have a left party, or we wanna be able to knock on all doors and talk to everybody about everything. And having a kind of narrow messaging, uh, you know, is not necessarily a way to do that. You know, you really have to be about issues, uh, not about slogans, uh, things that talk to, talk to real people on the street and, and show some promise of breaking beyond, uh, you know, 1% vote totals. And here, uh, finding a popular and explosive messaging that, that reaches to new issues and new people is the, the only way to get on the, you know, the map for, um, uh, you know, for the media, for media and to have people uh, hear about uh, the candidates and, and actually turn out to vote for them since we have no ballot access and few prospects of doing that unless some legal uh, rabbits are pulled out of the hat and it's not that's not looking great um finally uh, i'm going to uh i'm going to uh, challenge and take uh umbrage at being accused of uh bigotry uh by this candidate who has not uh been paying attention to this issue for the year that I have and researching it intensely and involved in discussions with people, this party should have a discussion about this. Uh, this party should not be uh, taking messages from elsewhere and uh, you know, kind of dive bombing in to uh, attack people. I think it's... Um, Jeff, did we lose Jeff? Yeah, I think he froze. Let's give him a couple seconds. Um, Adam, do you want to go ahead and talk about the elections? Um, and then we'll break away to Indica. We're pretty behind schedule right now. So we need right. a uh, point of order here. Yeah. So, um, the elections, it should be pretty straightforward. Um, really, this this time um, is just to make sure everybody was able to get their ballot cast okay, make sure nobody had any issues. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, quickly, did, did anybody in here have any issues voting? It looks like we have 26 responses so far, and there's 24 participants here. Um, so overall, it looks okay. Um, does, does anybody have anything? Because I can, um, for the music, uh, start a breakout room and we can uh, figure out your issue as the music is going on and, and continue. Great. If anybody does have any issues, go ahead and send Adam a message and he will work with you and get you set up to, to work those out. Yeah. So next up on our agenda is we're going to have some live music from a local band here in Indianapolis, uh, Brandon and Alicia Doherty from Indica Live. And I am going to turn the floor over to them. They are here, just bear with them as they join the meeting. Thank you. You see us? Hi. Thank you so much for having us. We got a thumbs up. Can you guys hear us? Thumbs up. Nice. All right, here we are. This song's called Yesterday. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not
Funny to have the, the dead silence on a live feed versus a live show. So, <laughs> get some uh, audience mics back on in here. But <laughs> Ooh. This song's called Both Eyes. Not keeping both eyes open. Most of our songs are inspired by Helping the Earth. This song's definitely. Oh, 
Uh, we're, we're Indica, that's I-N-D-Y-C-A. You can find us at indicamusic.com. Check us out, we're on all the streaming platforms. Here's with the full band, full piece. We feel really honored to be here with you guys today. Thank you, Terry. Most excellent. All right. All right. Indica. Indica. All right. That was, you guys, that was amazing. Mm, Thank you so much. Time. I don't think they're done yet, Michelle. <laughs> Not yet. Oh. Do one more. Yeah, 
and everything you well. They tried not to fall true, even when you fell. In those dark times, I tried not to dwell. When you're my music, but I always prevail. Know that this chain will get back on no more. Here comes the way that we open the cell. When there's no path, we will make our own trail. We will make our own trail. Excellent. You guys, thank you so much for coming to our Congress. Beautiful Indica. Hello, everybody. My name is Michelle Holliday. I'm pleased to be um, calling everybody back from the break of the Indiana Green Party's annual Congress of 2021. Just briefly, I am the statewide press secretary for the Indiana Green Party. I'm also the chair of the Indiana Green Party's Cannabis Caucus. And today, to kick off the last part of Congress, it is my honor and pleasure to be introducing our next speaker. His name is Jack Kane. Jack is the secretary of iNormal, which is the Indiana chapter of the National Organization of Reform for Marijuana Laws. This is one of the oldest lobbying, advocacy, and activist organizations dedicated to ending marijuana prohibition within the United States. Normal was founded in the fall of 1970 in Washington, DC by the friends Larry Schott and Keith Straub, who met while working with the National Commission of Product Safety. Normal has chapters in all 50 states, including Indiana, where they are known as iNormal, Indiana Normal, which was started in 1974 by Steve Dillon, a prominent Indianapolis lawyer and a current member of the national board. iNormal has been working throughout the state to raise awareness about the outdated and inefficient laws surrounding the issues of 
of marijuana. Jack is a 69-year-old Indianapolis native involved in many volunteer organizations. He has been a member of iNormal since 2001. Jack has served in several positions on the board of directors, including the membership director, vice chairman, and his current position as secretary. Jack has also led many rallies, marches, lectures on this subject. He's always available to meet with any group to discuss this vital issue. So feel free to reach out to contact him. And right now, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jack Kane. Jack, you have the floor. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much. That was a very nice introduction, Michelle. So uh, thanks very much for letting us come in at uh, Normal and talk with you guys. Uh, it's very exciting to see some new blood and some new ideas and some new directions in the politics here in Indiana. So congratulations for what you're doing. Uh, we want to do everything we can to try and uh, break the Republican stranglehold on the uh, local politics. So uh, good luck to uh, you guys and everything you're doing. Uh, we're, uh, as Michelle said, you know, we're a local organization that's a local chapter of a national organization. We've been working very hard to try and uh, convince people that it's really ridiculous to keep arresting people for marijuana. That's uh, our prime, my primary focus is why these laws don't make any sense at all. Obviously, there's a lot of people that, and people of your party there uh, and veterans and others around the state that are using uh, cannabis, uh, not just for its intoxicating effect, but for its med medical uh, benefits. And as we've gotten around to talk to people throughout the state, I've been uh, stunned to see how many uh, people, a lot of veterans we've talked to, uh, who have been uh, able to completely get off all of their opiates uh, by using cannabis, or at least reduce that. So it's, uh, and uh, we've talked to medical, MS patients. Uh, we've got a good friend that is an MS patient that can barely walk until she takes some cannabis. And then all of a sudden she can, she can walk and have a normal life. Uh, so it's really important that we uh, focus on this issue and uh, let the people know that the change has to come. One of the things that we're doing right now is we've got regional directors in each area, Fort Wayne, uh, Lafayette, Kokomo, uh, Richmond area. They're out uh, talking to local officials and trying to get uh, holding events and trying to get people to uh, rally to the cause and contact their legislator. And that is by far the, the only, a lot of people say that, hey, we want to, I'll sign any petition, we'll get the law changed, it'll be a ballot measure. That does not work in Indiana. We do not have, a, we're not a ballot state. Any change that must come, must come through the legislature, okay? And as you know, the uh, current legislator, legislature is not very pro-cannabis. So it's up to us to get out motivate people to contact their legislators, get on the phone, send an email, send a letter, and let them know that we need to change these laws. Something needs to be done. And there's a couple of uh, holdups in the uh, legislature where people have really been uh, thwarting our efforts to move forward. And we're gonna be calling them out a little bit later this year and having some information about uh, how we can attack them. But the biggest thing you can do to help uh, this is spread the word. We can, uh, as Michelle mentioned, we'd love to be able to come out to your locale and do a meet and greet, discuss uh, the uh, cannabis and the wonderful uh, impact, or imp wonderful effects of that and the negative impact of the laws uh, against marijuana. So we'd love to come out and do a meet and greet or an event. We're having an event this uh, Sunday evening up in Carmel. They're gonna have Carmel Pride from four to eight o'clock at the uh, Center for the Green, which is next to the Palladium downtown Carmel. And uh, we've got a booth there. We're going to be handing out uh, information. We're going to be selling stickers. Ta-da! And yard signs. So you can go online and buy these. Or if you have a chance to come by Carmel, please stop by. And uh, if you uh, want us to come out to your uh, locale, we'd love to have a chance to do that. Uh, myself, uh, Sky Wolf, Neil Smith is also on the board. He's very uh, involved and knowledgeable on the subject. And uh, Indica is a great band, so they play for some of our benefits. So I'm glad to see them around. Uh, good luck to you guys. And I don't know, any other questions or anything I want, should talk, be discussing or you want to ask about? No, I'm, I'm assuming you're all pretty familiar with cannabis and uh, it's a fact. So <laughs> I feel, feel like I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here, but. Uh, we really do. <laughs> we are familiar. You know, Jack, how yeah. can everybody contact you for uh, if they want you to speak? Probably, uh, I can send you my, uh, uh, Michelle, I'll send you my email address. Okay? Beautiful. 
and uh, they can contact me. Yeah, we'd love to have a chance to come out there and talk. It's one of our favorite subjects. And, uh, you know, anything, anything we can do to help you guys, we're, we're trying to partner with various organizations to uh, provide a more united front to the legislators. And uh, so anything we can do to work with you guys, we'd, we'd love to have a chance to do because we're not getting much movement. We're not getting enough movement from the Democrats and we're not getting any movement at all from the Republicans. So we need to apply some political pressure to get them motivated to change. So, any other questions or? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Um, is there any legislation pending right now? Any bills decriminalize uh, marijuana? Here in Indiana, no, there's not. There were 15 bills that were introduced last session. Uh, none of, the only one that got a hearing was one that uh, dropped the or established a legal precedent for uh, intoxication with marijuana at five nanograms. Uh, but other than that, no. There every year, there's uh, Senator Tallien has been the one that's been pushing this very strongly for years and years and years. And every time she brings up legislation, the Republican leaders or the chairman don't even give it a, a hearing. So basically, going nowhere. We're hoping that the feds, with some of the changes that they make, will uh, put some pressure and make it easier for our job here in Indiana. What about hemp? Hemp has been legalized. It's really interesting because hemp now is we used to be hemp. Norma was one of the few people who talked about industrial hemp. Okay, but now that industrial hemp is starting to take off and it's legal, uh, that's kind of been a different issue, and they're working very hard. It's an agricultural product, and they're working very hard to eliminate some of the uh, ridiculous restraints that they've got on uh, on growing hemp. But there's several farmers around the state that are growing hemp, and there's a growing uh, marketplace for that. Does that help? Yeah, it does. I didn't. I was unaware that it had been legalized. Yeah, I've been I legalized in Northwest Indiana. Yeah, it's been uh, up in Northwest Indiana. We have residual hemp uh, outbreaks from back in the days from World War One when it was legalized, and it just they could never eradicate it up here. So yeah, it was ditch weed. I bought some of that. I was wondering if that ended. It's good for two things: ditch weed and that ditch weed. It's good for getting your headache and getting you busted. But yeah, this it's the residual yeah. hemp that was grown during the war. So, um, right. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? I'd love to talk about pot. So, any other questions? <laughs> I've got one for you. Uh, anyone um, other than the usual suspects on, uh, well, any Republicans uh, movable on this issue, just in case somebody lives in their district here? Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. We, we obviously Jim Lucas has uh, been a, a strong proponent of this. He's got a really excellent uh, grasp of the nature of the problem. Uh, so he's moving. We're hearing that you know some of the Republicans are uh, maybe supporting measures or, or becoming co-sponsors on some of the bills. Uh, so they're kind of moving, but not really. Uh, what our hope is is as the feds move towards legalization. The more and more the people are starting to, more and more the Republicans are starting to realize, hey, this is going to happen. We need to be prepared for it. We should be at least thinking about it, uh, which is exactly what Governor Holcomb has decided not to do, not even talk about it. Uh, so we're, we're uh, cautiously optimistic, but not very excited about the possibility of the Republicans coming around. But uh, the biggest, and one of the big things, and we should all, would, all will do this too, is focus on uh, the national legislature, uh, national Congress and Senate, to get them to consider the MORE Act and the SAFE Act. The SAFE Act is about banking, and the MORE Act is uh, decriminalizing marijuana and, uh, and uh, removing uh, any uh, expunging records. That's what it was. So we're trying to be nice, but uh, it's frustrating. I swim in those waters. Thanks for the, uh, so I understand. Uh, <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for the answer. Yeah, no, no problem. Anyone else? Yeah. But what about medical marijuana? Are there any doctors involved in the efforts to legalize medical marijuana? Because other states have done so, right? Oh, yeah. There's like 33, more than 33 states, uh, there's more and more all the time. Uh, even people like Mississippi and Alabama are leading uh, ahead of Indiana because Indiana, they've legalized medical marijuana. 
the uh, yeah, we well, a couple of years ago we had a 2018. There was a summer study uh, session that they were going to talk about marijuana, and they were going to talk about it for several days, and then it was just going to be one day, and then it was going to be just four hours, and then it was going to be two hours. You guys had two hours to talk about medical marijuana. Uh, at that point, we did have four different doctors uh, that came on and talked about medical marijuana and how beneficial it was, and how they'd love to be able to prescribe it for their patients, but they couldn't. Uh, so they have, but there we, we're not getting any. Uh, help from the medical establishment in the Indiana Medical Association. And so they're kind of somewhat afraid to stick their head up and say, hey, yeah, I want to do this. Uh, so there's still some reluctance with the whole stigma around it. But more and more all the time, yeah. Great. I'm going to have to interrupt. And I want to invite everybody, especially you, Jack, to come to our social hour at, at 4 p.m., where it'll be an informal discussion. Um, this group loves to talk marijuana. So if you, if you can um, hang out with us at four, that would be really great. I would like to turn now the, the floor over to Adam for the announcements of the unofficial election results. Adam? Hey, thanks everybody. We really appreciate the opportunity. Have a good meeting. Thank thanks so you. much, Jack. Gary, I'd love to stay, but I've got to go out of town. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I want to share my screen real quick. Um, Again, these are completely unofficial. Uh, let me close the voting. Um, hopefully everybody got their votes in. So that's off now. Um, you all see that okay? It does look like, so these are the people that voted. It does look like a few people voted twice. So we're gonna have to go through these and make sure only the last votes count. Um, so a few of these will be deleted um, and then we'll have to also, you know, verify that uh, um, that the ranked choice voting results are right because on, on Google Docs, uh, we can't, they don't automatically calculate that for us. But I think for most of these, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. Um, so this is gonna be again, unofficial and we'll come back to it uh, once it is official and, and we look it all over. Um, so for bylaws revisions, um, I believe we needed uh, 66 and two thirds um, so for at least with this, uh, before throwing out these votes, it looks like proposal A is going to be accepted. Um, and that's for adopting the candidate vetting procedures. Uh, proposal B uh, for the membership definitions, this one is right on the line um, at the moment. It does look like that is going to be adopted also. Um, proposal C or D, um, this one is very split. Uh, clearly nothing is close to the the 66 and two thirds percent. So that one, it looks like um, it looks like nothing is going to be changed um, in that regard with the CC voting. Uh, the procedural authority uh, again. This one is also very close. It does look like uh, consensus um, is is going to be uh, the way that the CC uh, might conduct business going forward. Um, now to the elections. Um, again, unofficial. Uh, but this one, so the chair, the first choice, it looks like John Shearer um, took it in, uh, in an overwhelming majority there with, with 23 votes. And that's out of um, how many came in here? 33 total. Uh, so that's probably going to stay. Congratulations, John. Um, assistant chair, it uh, looks like out of 33, Cassidy uh, has it with, with 21 in the first round. Um, again, a simple majority wins for these elections. Um, so congratulations, Cassidy. Uh, documentarian, looks like uh, Ken got it. Congratulations, Ken. Uh, treasurer, Michael Cooper, looks like he's gonna run away with it. Um, and then our communications director, uh, the Holmeses unfortunately weren't able to make it today. A majority would be over, um, with, with 33, we need to have 17. Uh, so in the first round, looks like nobody took it, but it does look like Byron. Um, Byron did get a few more votes. So in the second round, it does look like Byron is gonna be Orletta and uh, none of the above. Um, we'll, we'll verify that though, once we get this finalized. And then the National Committee delegate winners, this one. Um, so blue, we've got 
Ken had 13, or uh, Jacob, I'm sorry, had 13 in the first round, followed by Sarah with 11 and Jeff with eight. Uh, so Jacob and Sarah looks like in both the first and second rounds, it looks like uh, it's, it's going to end up being them with Jeff as the alternate. Um, but we'll have to run these numbers through the, the rank choice voting protocols, but uh, in a glimpse, that looks like that's where we're at. Great, thank you, Adam. Um, so now we are going to move on to um, more of advancing our green, our green movement. And to help advance the green movement and our values, we've invited the Indian chapter of Answer Coalition, that's Act Now to Stop War and End Racism, to share with us how we can partner and get involved. Here today with Answer Indiana is Noah Leininger. Leininger. Um, he is the local co-coordinator of Answer Indiana, and he has been with Answer since 2017. In 2018, Noah and his fellow co-coordinator, Sam James, co-authored the study, Policing Panhandling, Implications of Race, Housing Status in Indianapolis, 2015 through 18, which revealed disproportionate arrests and citations of Black people for panhandling by IMPD um, amid council efforts to criminalize being homeless downtown. And in 2019, he traveled to Cuba on a people-to-people -people edu education trip organized by the Cuba-Venezuela Solidarity Committee. Noah is proud to organize alongside his wife. When he is not in the streets, he is a student, a teacher of instrumental music and history, and is a caregiver of two talkative cats. And without further ado, Noah. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks to the Green Party for the kind invitation to be here. Uh, to explain a little bit more about what the Answer Coalition is, I'll describe the work of the national organization that drew our organizers to start a chapter here in Indiana in 2017. Founded just three days after the September 11, 2001 attacks, the Answer Coalition initiated the massive anti-war movement opposing the U.S. invasion of Iraq in the months prior to March 19, 2003. The Answer Coalition demonstration of 200,000 people on October 26, 2002 in Washington, D.C. ignited a nationwide and global anti-war movement that was nearly unprecedented in history. On January 18, 2003, 500,000 people packed the mall in Washington, D.C. under the slogan, Stop the War Before It Starts. The Washington Post described the January 18th demonstration as the largest anti-war protest since the end of the Vietnam War. Answer, which at its core included a partnership between Arab and non-Arab activists, fought a long and successful battle against excluding the Palestinian struggle for self-determination from the anti-war and peace movement. In the years since, we have mobilized across the country to stop the repeated assaults against and massacres of the people of Gaza. Answer has mobilized against the illegal coup and UN occupation of Haiti, against the illegal blockade of Cuba, and the illegal regime change war on Libya. We are actively fighting against the ongoing occupation of Afghanistan, the renewed assaults on Iraq and Syria, the drone attacks on Yemen, Pakistan, and Somalia, among others. ANSWER has played an important role in the fight against racist and religious profiling, in support of immigrant and workers' rights, and for economic and social justice for all. Our members are engaged in a range of struggles from the local battles against police brutality to the international campaigns against militarism and war. So that's what drew us to ANSWER. And so even though ANSWER has only been active in Indiana since 2017, when I say active, I do mean active. Uh, our organizers and volunteers have participated in and led hundreds of demonstrations, including several climate strikes and environmental actions at the State House in Indianapolis, rallies in solidarity with the Cuban, Venezuelan, and Bolivian peoples against efforts by the US government to overthrow their democratically elected governments, against the illegal assassination of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani by the Trump administration, which was a major act of war and illegal under both US and international law. In defense of immigrant workers standing with Kosecha, Indiana to demand driver's licenses for all, to close the ICE concentration camps, and for protections for all undocumented workers in the United States. We were actively participating in the months-long uh, uprising against racism that erupted last summer. 
Uh, we organized car caravans across Indiana from Brazil to Indianapolis up to Westville that brought attention to the dire situation uh, inside prisons and ICE facilities during the COVID-19 pandemic and calling for the immediate compassionate release of ICE prisoners and of hundreds of at-risk people who are unjustly incarcerated. And most recently, we joined in the Palestinian people's resistance in demanding a, an end to USA to Israel after the IDF attacks on Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, during Ramadan and the still ongoing ethnic cleansing of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem and the bombardment of Gaza. Some of these rallies and demonstrations drew hundreds or even thousands of people, and some brought out only a handful. But regardless of the size of the crowd, we've always had encouraging and inspiring conversations with our fellow workers about these critically important issues, and even a small presence on a busy street corner can be seen by hundreds of people. Most of our organizers live in the Indianapolis area, where we organize as part of the Indy Liberation Center, but we're able to support work across the state, and we welcome organizers from all 92 counties to get in touch with us. If you're passionate about fighting against the imperialist war machine and defending black, brown, and indigenous people from racist attack, get in touch with us. You can sign up to receive our newsletter and to volunteer, no matter where you are in the state, on our website at indieliberationcenter.org slash answer, and I'll drop that link in the chat. You can also follow us on social media. Our handle is at Answer Indiana, all one word, for both Facebook and Twitter. And we are at Answer Coalition for our national uh, page on all social media. You can also, if you have any questions, I don't want to take any time. I know we've got other things to get to. But if you have any questions and you want to get in touch with me, you can uh, reach me via email at noah at answerindiana.org. Thanks so much again to the Green Party for having me here today. And I hope to see you all in the streets. Thank you, Noah. We really appreciate everything Answer Indiana is doing. I've been out in the streets with you guys, and I will see you again in the future. Thank you. Uh, we're going to skip ahead um, just to stay, stay respectful to our guests that have showed up at certain times. Um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Adam, and he is going to introduce our next guest. Okay, so our next guest goes right in line with our platform regarding democracy and political form. Um, our platform uh, on the national level uh, specifically calls for enacting ranked choice voting all across America. Um, and with that, um, we have Jason Torpy here, who is a South Bend resident, uh, originally from Ohio. He left Ohio to enlist in the Army and was eventually offered a commission through West Point. After graduation, he served as an Army captain in Germany and Iraq. He left the military to pursue an MBA at the Ohio State University. He served as a management consultant with IBM, and he now acts as an independent consultant offering supply chain solutions as First Things First, LLC. Of more relevance here, though, he has founded and served on the boards of various nonprofits from smaller activities to multi-million dollar national organizations. Nonprofits have included charitable, charitable organizations, lobbying organizations, and PACs. He brings this passion to Better Ballot Indiana and the effort to bring ranked choice voting to Indiana. So with that, uh, Jason, I hand it over to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you to the Green Party uh, for having me here. And I see Sarah and I see Terry and I see George Wolf here and uh, a lot of other people who have been been involved uh, with Better Ballot as well. So, you know, I'm really excited to present to all of you um, and I want to ask, like, who's ever heard don't waste your vote, right? Everybody, right? Who never wants to hear it again in your whole life, right? Everybody wants to never hear it again in your whole life. Well, ranked choice voting is the way to make that happen. So um, I don't think I really need to sell it to you any harder than that, but I'm going to continue, <laughs> right? Let me take this closer to home, right? This isn't a public poll or anything, but ask yourself, how many of you voted for Joe Biden rather than Howie Hawkins, because your ballot only gave you one choice, right? Probably more than one of you, and it sucks, right? So many of us don't vote our conscience. We don't put the, we don't vote our conscience. We don't put, put our first choice down, and we don't get full participation in democracy because our ballots are engineered for one choice only. And I don't know about you, but it drives me crazy, okay? Imagine a world where the Green Party and the Democratic Party and the Democratic Socialists and the Progressive Democrats and the rest stop arguing about viable candidates, start focusing on positions and improving the nation, right? Ranked choice voting allows that. And I hope 
I'm getting you excited about this prospect if you're not already, right? I think you know about uh, ranked choice voting, but just in case, I wanna give you a quick rundown on what it is. So for the voter, you enter the voting booth and you vote for your favorite as normal. Then if you want, you can vote for as few or as many others as you like in order. Okay, so easy. You just make another couple of check marks. So for the voter, easy. Um, and the machines can do it as well, definitely within their capability. So in counting the votes, the first round's the same. Everyone's number one vote is counted. So then until the candidate has 50% of the vote, additional voting rounds continue with the last place candidate dropped in each round. So, but those votes aren't thrown in the trash like status quo plurality voting. Whoever voted for the last place candidate has their next choice counted in the next round, right? So if you voted for, you know, Howie first and Joe Biden second, right? Then Howie might not get enough votes, right? In the, in the previous election, but your, you, your vote for Joe Biden, your number two vote would still have counted. And that, you know, sounds more like democracy to me. I mean, it's a refreshing change from the current system where 60% or more people may dislike the actual elected candidate. You know, we get an actual 50% majority of people who actually voted for the candidate every time, right? And I think that's better just democracy too, just in terms of public mandate. So what it also means is with these multiple rounds, the first round is published and all the rounds are published. So it's not like a secret what the first round looked like. So Howie might get 10% in the first round rather than a depressed, and I'm using Howie Hawkins as an example, right? Because obviously he's the national candidate. Um, so I use different examples with different audiences. But uh, Howie might get 10% in the first round rather than a depressed 1% in status quo voting because of, quote, viable candidate shaming, right? Greater visibility of this voter presence in the first round is a great path to empowering third parties in American democracy, you know, and that's that's really what we're all about, better democracy. Um, and it really seems like an obvious choice to me, right? It's really hard to argue against doing things this way. Um, the only arguments I've heard is that democracy might happen. Well, if we allow ranked choice voting, then my candidate who kind of lives on, you know, plurality voting and wins 37% every time, well, my candidate might not win, right? Or my candidate wins with, you know, only kind of core centrist, you know, Republican, for example, votes, and he couldn't win with a coalition of green and democratic socialists and core Democrats all voting together, right? So we wouldn't want that. Um, now, that's just an argument against democracy, not an argument against ranked choice voting. And I hope at least here, we're not, none of us are arguing against democracy. So again, I'm representing betterballotindiana.org. Uh, you can also follow, find us at, at betterballotin on Twitter, Facebook, other social media. And I really appreciate your time today, having me here um, and all the work that you're doing on your other platforms, right? You know, we only have one, you know, one platform, ranked choice voting at the sub-state level in Indiana, right? You have lots of platforms and I really appreciate that, that uh, your platform includes what we're doing. And I really look forward for, our two organizations working together in any way we can to uh, advance ranked choice voting. So I'm open for questions. I don't know if that's on the table for today, but but thank you very much for what you're doing. Thank you for having me here today. And and thanks for using a bit of ranked choice voting and even in your own organization. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, I would say that we would normally take questions, um, but we are running a little behind. Um, I don't know if you want to stick around for a little bit and maybe answer some questions at the end. Um, we, we do, you know, have, have some people here too that are part of Better Ballot Indiana. Um, if you guys don't know, the CC did endorse Be uh, Better Ballot Indiana a few months ago. Uh, they had Howie Hawkins actually come to one of their meetings. Um, and um, we are, you know, working hand in hand uh, with them. Um, and there are many volunteer opportunities available through all these organizations. And I would encourage uh, anybody who's interested in ranked choice voting to check out Better Ballot Indiana. So thank you so much, Jason, for showing up. Um, I think that uh, Terry uh, can correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, we're going to go ahead and um, skip ahead to Ron Placone for our entertainment. Um, and then uh, we'll swing back around uh, eventually to our, our uh, candidates forum. Um, but we appreciate Ron being here. 
Um, Ron, let me find the, uh, the introduction here for you. Uh, he's a uh, comedian. Uh, he appears regularly on the Jimmy Dore Show. Um, many of you uh, probably know him from the Jimmy Dore Show. I know I, I personally am a, a big fan of Jimmy um, and, and Ron as well. Uh, I always appreciate his, his witty, quick uh, commentary. Um, he's been seen on Crosstalk, TMZ, Free Speech TV, The Young Turks, Redacted Tonight, and more. His debut album, Agnostic Holiday, is in rotation on Sirius XM. He hosts the YouTube show, Get Your News On with Ron. Let's give a warm welcome to Ron Placone. Thanks so much for being here, Ron. What's up, everybody? Hello. Hi, Greens. I, uh, I've been listening to some of the stuff going on so far, and I heard uh, Cannabis anti-war, ranked choice voting, cats, and I realized I am in the right place. It is good to be here. I am in the right place. Good to see y'all. Um, and shout out to Indiana, actually. I, uh, I went to IU, so, uh, so shout, out to, uh, shout out to everyone in Indiana, all y'all in Indiana, and uh, I hope everyone's okay. There was some flooding, yeah? That happened recently. I hope everyone is okay. <laughs> Um, I, uh, man, I feel like if a flood would have happened in Bloomington when I was in college, I would have been too hammered to notice, to tell you the truth. I, I would have just been like, oh, they put a pool on campus. That's awesome. But anyway, I hope everyone is okay. I, I hope everyone is doing well. Um, rain choice voting. I, um, I was thrilled to hear about that. And I, I appreciate the work y'all do for that. And that was, uh, don't you just love all the condescending, like, we can't possibly, it's so complicated. Look at how complicated this is. I can't, how can we possibly rank our choices as adults? How can we do that? Haven't you ever walked into a restaurant and there was more than one menu item you'd be willing to eat? You just started panicking and left the restaurant in shame, right? We can't possibly list preferences as grown adults. This is way too complicated. And we wouldn't want to complicate the great system we have now. The system with gerrymandering and the electoral <laughs> college and super delegates. We wouldn't want to complicate this super simple, efficient thing that we got now. We wouldn't want to complicate it. Ranked choice voting, we, we'd complicate this great, this great, great, wonderful thing we have now. So let's not, let's not do it. Um, yeah, no, we should do it. And I, um, yeah, I just love the whole don't throw away your vote thing, the way people were, uh, were talking about that. I just, uh, you know, I live in California, which people refer to as a safe state. Um, I don't like to use that phrase. I don't like the word safe state because I think there is nothing safe about a system that assures that two Wall Street owned parties keep power all the time. There's nothing safe <laughs> about that. So I like to call it a decided state. That's what I call it. I, I live in a decided state, um, but uh, yeah. So rank choice voting for for uh, for sure. I uh, I love music. We'll go there. That's the only thing I didn't hear in on uh, on my list of things I love a bunch. I haven't heard music yet, so I'll be the music guy. Um, I like a lot of different music. I like a lot of punk rock music. I grew up with a lot of punk rock music, and. Um, when I was when I was like 12, a lot of the bands I listened to were already dudes in their 30s and stuff. So their hair kind of looks like my hair now. Like they just push it up and go about their day. That was what they did. And uh, and when I was a kid, I wanted my hair to look like theirs. I was like, my hair needs to look like theirs. And it never did. No matter what I did, my hair would look not look like theirs. I didn't know why. And now, all these years later, I realize why. It's because when I was uh, 12, I wasn't balding yet. <laughs> that's the difference like 12 year old me would think 30 year old me was pretty cool but uh but yeah it's not i'd be like hold on as long as you can young man hold on um i'm also uh, a big classic rock fan I'll, I'll let you guys respond first are there any classic rock fans here i'm assuming with the green bunch we got some but uh but anyway i'm a big classic rock fan and uh one of my favorite bands is Jethro Tull. They're one of my favorite classic rock bands of all time. And uh, the big thing about Jethro Tull is that they never, uh, they never did drugs. That's the folklore about them. <laughs> they were not a druggy band, Jethro Tull. And uh, I don't think that's true because this conversation, hey, do you want to start a rock and roll band? Yeah, I want to start a rock and roll band. Okay, cool. I'm going to play flute and sing. Awesome. <laughs> 
That is not a conversation two sober people had. They for sure did not. They were they were high as kites when they had that conversation. And then four albums later, they were like, hey, did we decide to use that flute? Yeah, we've been using it for four albums. People dig it. Okay, cool. Let's keep it up. That's what happened. That's what they want. That's that's history, folks. That's history. Um, I uh, so y'all were talking about normal was here talking about cannabis. So I, I live in a place where it is legal. Uh, cannabis is legal where I live in California. People get on our case for it. They're like, yeah, you people in California, you really love your pot. You love your pot in California. You guys just pot all the time. Eh. And it's like, yeah, we love our pot because we're really freaking good at it. Have you ever been out here? We have we have really good stuff. That's why we like it. That's how places work. Do you do that everywhere you go? Like, do you go out to Italy and you're like, oh, you guys love your tomatoes. Big whoop-de-woo, tomatoes, big deal. You know, like, do you go out to Alaska and you're just like, salmon, I get it. Woo, who cares? Whoop-de-doo. Do you go out to New Mexico and you're like, I get it, meth. Big deal. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, yeah, we, we do our cannabis well. We like it. Uh, and of course, there were some cat shout outs. My cat is running around here somewhere. I'm actually looking for it. Oh, she's on the couch. Uh, it is my cat's birthday. Uh, my cat, oh. Lucy, who uh, who is actually uh, also from Bloomington. Lucy has lived in, um, what, like four or five different states. Cats can't appreciate that kind of thing. She doesn't care, but it's the truth. And uh, she was a stray in Bloomington, Indiana, because I got her my senior year of college. So she is uh, she is 15 this month. I don't know exactly when she was born. She was a stray, but she's 15 this month. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I gave her her birthday present, and uh, she uh, she won this pandemic. Actually, she totally won between my wife and myself. She had unlimited playtime. She had unlimited attention. She had so much playtime, she lost a little bit of weight. She can make jumps that she hasn't been able to make for years. She's been lifting weights. She has a prison tattoo. She crushed it. She crushed this pandemic. She is rocking it. Um, my wife and I, sometimes we argue a little bit about the cat, uh, a little bit, not a lot, but sometimes I feel like my wife blames the cat for too much, you know? Like one time she was like, oh, my throat's a little scratchy. I think it's because some of Lucy Stander got in the air conditioning vent. I'm like, really? You're going to put that on the cat? Or one time she was like, oh, you know, I didn't sleep well last night. I think it's because Lucy was on the other side of the bed, you know? Or one time she was like, hey, I've been reading a lot about 9-11. Where was Lucy that day? It's like, come on. <laughs> come on. Catnip can't melt still beans. We've been through this so many times. It was not Lucy. It was not. And then I, I'm the other extreme, folks. I blame the cat for absolutely nothing. Like one time, my wife and I got home, and there was this chair in our apartment that was completely shredded. Like it was just shredded completely. And I'm like, ah, earthquake. So <laughs> we were two extremes. We really are two extremes. But uh, she's been crushing it. I, um, I gotta say this, since this is a uh, politically minded bunch, I, I think that um, I think that what we need to do is, is we uh, we overrate the Constitution. Uh, Constitution, there's some okay stuff in that document, but um, the real headliner here, folks, is not the Constitution. It is the Declaration of Independence, because the Declaration of Independence allows us to make a people's legislature, and I think that's what we should do. I think the Senate get rid of it, the House get rid of it we bring back the draft hear me out but we bring back the draft for one person president every four years we draft the president all they do the laws that we make as one people they just have to be the administrative person that signs it into law and it's a shitty job that nobody freaking wants and every four years we just draft someone for that gig like we're just like hey congratulations steve and richmond you're the president i don't want to be president well, that makes you more qualified than anyone else who's ever had the job. Be in D.C. at 48 hours. That's what we got to do. Won't be a fun gig. You'll get some travel perks. You'll get that. You'll get to go around the world. You know, you'll get to go to all the U.N. meetings. They'll just be like, ah, Steve, the United States guy, what do you think about all this? I just miss being a carpenter. All right, thanks for your input. Hey, you guys aren't blowing up the planet anymore, so the rest of the world's happy. We really like this draft the president thing you guys are doing. Keep it up. That's what I think we should do. And the Declaration of Independence allows us to do that. Because here's, here's another piece of history 
that they will not teach you in schools. And this is the freaking truth. The Declaration of Independence was written during a party. Everybody was hammered. Everybody was intoxicated. Everyone was giving high fives. People were like, yeah, let's start a rock band with a flute. They were partying hard, <laughs> you know, and they were passing around the document. And they were like, hey, John, are you going to sign this document? He was like, yeah, I'm going to sign the document really big, too, because the word talk is in my name. <laughs> Woo! And they were having this good old time. Then the next morning, they woke up and they sobered up and they looked at that document. and They were like, ah, some of us have power and we have land and slaves and shit like that. So they decided to write the Constitution. They were like, Let, let's let's keep this in check a little bit. That's uh, that's something that is 110 percent true. And they will not teach you that in school. You did not learn that in school. Mitch Daniels didn't allow it. Mitch Dan, uh, by, by the way, I mean, I, you know, I, I said, I went to IU. So I, I was like, man, there, there will never be, there will never be an Indiana politician worse than Mitch Daniels. And then Mike Pence was like, hold my beer, <laughs> hold my beer in my chastity belt. I'm here. <laughs> like, well, I spoke too soon. There is somebody. Um, I'll tell you this, this is, this is kind of a fun thing too. I, um, one of the things that I really tried to do during the pandemic, and I'm still keeping up with it, I'm trying to get better at Italian, uh, and I use the Duolingo app. I don't know if you guys have ever used that app. It is, uh, it is helpful, but it's a, bit, uh, it's a bit hostile. It is a little bit of a hostile app. I got this email from Duolingo at two in the morning. Like I saw it the next morning, and they go, bad news. You dropped out of the top 10. Only the top 10 advanced to future lessons. I was like, this app is judging me while I'm sleeping. What is this? <laughs> You're not dreaming in Italian, we can tell. Like, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and also I wondered, who are these nine other people I'm competing with? I want their information and their names because I don't think any of us want to compete with each other. I think we just don't want to have to pay for the app. So really, like, we'll just go ahead and form a union and only advance together, you know, like the people united will never miss preposition lessons. The people united. <laughs> We'll never miss prepositions lessons. What do we want? Numbers. When do we want it? When it's the appropriate unit. All right, we got to work on that one. What do we want? Numbers. <laughs> That's what we should do. That's what, and they, they get mad. I, I just lost a 111 day streak. 111 days. I was a little bummed out about that, but they, they freeze your streak and they get a little hostile with you too. You miss a day of practicing Italian or whatever language you're doing, they email you and they're just like, yeah, you know what? You missed today. You're not a very good husband. Practice Italian. You're like, whoa, all right. That's, you didn't need to make this. Then you miss a second day. They were, they're just like, your mom's going to swallow Italian. You're like, oh, Duolingo. Sheesh. All right. And uh, quite frankly, I think they need to get off their high horse a little bit, if I'm being honest. Sometimes Duolingo teaches me really useless things. Um, the other day, they taught me how to say, we don't give the horse candy. When will I ever need that? When am I ever going to need? You know, usually when I'm using my Italian, it's because I'm in Italy visiting my family who lives there. When am I going to need to know that gem? I guess like maybe <laughs> for some inexplicable reason, we go horseback riding and I could be like, hey, guys, guess what I learned? This, this is a horse, huh? We don't give him candy. No candy for this guy. We can give him un carote, if you know what I mean, a carrot, but no candy for this guy. Huh? They'd be like, that's great, Ron. I don't know. I, I, yeah, good for you. Congratulations. I, uh, you know, if they said that, like if the roles were reversed and my Italian family was here in America and for some reason we went horseback, I don't really go horseback riding, but if for some reason we went horseback riding and they said that to me in English, I would think something was wrong and they didn't know how to tell me. You know what I mean? Like, like, like if they were like, Ronaldo, we don't to give the horse candy. I'd be like, what are you trying to say? I'm worried someone has a broken arm. Say it in Italian, we'll figure this out. I don't know what's going on here, but, um, but yeah. Which by the way, I don't know if you guys knew this, but uh, during the pandemic, our, uh, our federal government decided, let's do nothing and see how that works. What if we just do other countries like, did some, nowhere had it perfect, and I'm not trying to imply anyone did. Of course they did, and there is no utopia. But other countries, they kind of realized, hey, you know, one of the reasons we have a federal government, if something like a pandemic happens, uh, we figure it out. The other countries freaking did that. The United States were like, well, riddle me this. What if we just do nothing? That's what we did. We were just like, let's just do, I think that the current president, which right now, Joe Biden, but whoever the current president is, 
should be on the face of a penny so that on a daily basis, Americans can be reminded of how fucking useless their government is <laughs> and that it shouldn't be continued in its current state. That's what I think we should do. But, uh, but anyway, we did absolutely nothing. Over in Italy, because I was in contact with my family, you know, one of the things they did, I mean, first of all, you know, they, they, they covered people's wages and they put a freeze on things and they actually, you know, took care of their people. But uh, they also gave everybody a free online pornography subscription. Everybody, <laughs> Italy's, by the way, Italy's right-wing government, just for the record. It wasn't even like, oh, a bunch of lefties. No, it was their more conservative party like and they were just like well some people might be alone and we all have needs so here's some <laughs> online porn like isn't that amazing like and uh which made me worry about my cousins on a whole different level uh because some of my cousins over there are young dudes in their 20s and 30s and uh you know i've hung out with them before they're they're, they're, they're horny guys all right they just are that's just a fact i was worried they were going to have a whole different problem like, I was worried I was going to Skype with them. And they were going to be like, Ronaldo, I did not get the virus, but my hands are stumps now. So much porn. <laughs> so much porn, you know? But uh, isn't that something, man? But they have they have pornography for all. We can't even get Medicare for all. Isn't that oh. something? Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Um, guys, thank you so much for letting me be part of this and letting me hang out with y'all. And thanks so much for everything you do. Peace. Thank Ron. you, Ron. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming here tonight. Uh, we're going to move along with our agenda on to the next section, which is a, a short presentation from the Sierra Club Hoosier um, with Amanda Shepard. And then we're going to go back and, and talk to the, the, our candidates, the section that we skipped. So Amanda Shepard has been with the Hoosier chapter direct or has been the Hoosier chapter director since April 2021. She has a BS and MS in geology. After teaching in public schools for several years, she moved into the corporate sector, but then trained with the Climate Reality Project in 2012. Amanda has committed her life to addressing gr the growing climate crisis. She served as an organizer for S Sustainable Indiana 2016, a volunteer for Earth Chapter Indiana, and is a former chair of the Indiana Green Party. And when she was hired by the Hoosier Environmental Council, where she served almost seven years, Amanda recently joined the ranks of the Sierra Club, and she is here to speak with us today to tell us how we can get involved and help Mother Earth. Amanda? Thank you, Terry. It's so good to see familiar faces and some new ones. It's always exciting to, to be back in the fold with the Green Party. Um, I do have just a few slides, so I'm going to try and share my screen here. Okay, and pull it up. So hopefully, can you all see that? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, like Terry said, I am with the Hoosier chapter of the Sierra Club. Um, I'm going to guess that most of you already know what the Sierra Club is, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about kind of the general information that I assume most of you know. Um, it is obviously a huge national organization. Uh, it has been around for a really long time, since 1892. Um, and there are 64 chapters all across the country, uh, almost 4 million members um, or supporters nationally. Um, and what I really want to do is you guys can kind of read what the mission historically has looked like on the right there. But um, as I've come into the chapter and learned more about what has been happening happening nationally, um, we have decided to really focus in on a little more on our equity work. Uh, and that is something that actually National has been focusing on the last several years too. If you all have not read uh, this really fabulous article by Hop Hopkins, who is our Director of Organizational Transformation, um, he has this article called Racism is Killing the Planet. And this quote uh, perfectly sums up all of the work that we are doing um, and why we're doing this kind of work. So when we look at the broad picture of what National Sierra Club is about and where we're going. So we have started doing strategic planning um, and really a full reorganization of what our organization is, is about and what 
kind of work we're focusing on. And so this tree kind of uh, provides a little bit of context. Um, I don't even think that this tree is made public yet. It's something that the executive committees are still working on at the national level, um, but I got my little hands on it. Um, and so what you see basically here is how we look at approaching all of these issues. So our core values and our mission are like the soil. And then all of our members, volunteers, staff, communities, those are the roots. And then as we come up, we look at what our vision is, and then we branch out into the type of work that we're doing. And so just in brief, um, Sierra Club is working to decarbonize the electric sector and reduce oil by 50% by 2030 and achieve 100% clean energy in all sectors by 2050. Uh, we wanna shift the US energy economy in ways that transform economic, racial and environmental inequity in parallel with other movements um, addressing injustice. We wanna protect 30% of our natural ecosystems by 2030 and by 2050, raise that to 50% confronting the extinction crisis. Uh, we're gonna ensure that all people have opportunities to explore and enjoy nature, inspiring and empowering a new generation of leaders to protect the environment. And then looking to mobilize and expand our base of 3.5 million members and supporters to demand climate action. So the Hoosier chapter is the Indiana branch of the Sierra Club. Um, so we are a statewide organization. We were formed in 1975. Um, we are a membership org and we currently have over 10,000 members in Indiana. Um, members, just so you all know, um, are different than, uh, than the people who maybe keep track of us. So we actually have, I think, closer to like 50 or 60,000 people who get our emails in the state. Um, but members are ones that actually donate and have a recurring membership with us. Um, so some of the things that we are looking at at the state level, um, we are undergoing our own strategic planning and realignment in order to more fully embrace liberation and equity work. Um, the chapter has long held equity as a central tenet of our work, but we know there is much more we can do in solidarity with those who are POC or who exist in other marginalized spaces and or identities. And we know that we can't have the priorities that you see on the left here as our env environmental priorities without also working for those on the right. Um, these are all interconnected. And so that's why we're putting an emphasis on being inclusive and people driven by implementing the Jimez principles um, in the coming months. Uh, we plan to reach out to equity and justice organizations organizations who've been on the ground doing the work to find out what role we can play in supporting their work and figure out where we can best plug in our resources. Um, and that's because we recognize that oftentimes solidarity looks like support and not necessarily always a leadership role. So the intention is really to learn what's already happening, how we as a chapter of Sierra Club can best plug in and support the ongoing efforts of those, even like the Green Party, um, who are already entrenched in doing the important work in their communities. All right, so it looks like I'm already at five minutes, so I'm gonna just fly through this really quickly. Um, these are just a few things that we've been working on. Um, some of the things that we've achieved over the last year, including, uh, holding a, <clears throat> a, uh, a refinery, the BP Whiting Refinery on Lake Michigan accountable. Um, so a federal judge ruled uh, that it repeatedly violated legal limits on deadly suit like particulate air pollution. Um, and that's in an area that is uh, socially um, downtrodden and not only from a low income standpoint, but also a, a, a very large community um, of minority populations. Uh, we have an online resource of food equity and justice organizations, organizations so I encourage you to check that out. Um, we're actively working to grow our volunteer network, so if you're interested, we would love to have you on board. Uh, we have expanded and renewed our staff to better achieve our goals. Like I said, I'm brand new. We have brought on a legislative coordinator to help work on legislative issues, um, and we are continuing anti-racist training as a team in order to further address the fight for liberation and justice. All right, so last slide. Uh, I encourage you to keep in touch and get involved if you're interested. We'd love to hear from you. Um, you can email us at hoosier.chapter at sierraclub.org and you can find us online. So thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Amanda, for speaking on behalf of Mother Earth. Um, as part of the, as the Green Party, we all are um, activists and really care about the environment. Thank you for sharing.
Uh, so now we are going to go back up the agenda to our candidate section that we skipped over. Um, I'm now going to give the floor to Jacob Bailey. Jacob Bailey is a candidate uh, for office. He's going to tell you a little bit about that. He's already gone through the Indiana Green Party's vetting procedure, and the Indiana Green Party has endorsed Jacob Bailey. Jacob, you have the floor. All right. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, yeah, uh, this has been great this afternoon. It's been great having some live music and a comedian. And I'm, a, I'm still a little bit stuck on the suggestion that Jethro Tull was at the Declaration of Independence signing. But anyway, uh, it's been great. A lot of interesting ideas. And I, I love the community here. Uh, so I am running for US Congress in the 9th District of Indiana. And so that is. Um, about 750,000 Hoosiers. It basically um, geographically runs from like Jeffersonville down on the Ohio River all the way up to about Mooresville, uh, getting close to Marion County there. And um, it's quite diverse. There's a lot going on. Um, it's been very Republican held for quite a while now. Um, the last number of elections have not been very close. And so uh, the things we're talking about this afternoon are, you know, very important about ranked choice uh, voting and everything like that, because um, generally third party candidates, we don't even know about them. Um, it's very difficult to um, even get on the ballot. So um, if you have 750,000 citizens uh, in a district, that means that you need to get about roughly 45,000 signatures which is a lot, which is, I mean, probably Democrat and Republicans would struggle to do that in their own district, even incumbents. Um, also, candidates are currently spending over a million dollars on that Congress seat. So I'm already having a lot of people saying, you know, you're crazy. You can't, you can't win an election like this. Um, you, you know, there's too much stacked against you. But um, there's a lot of good that can come out of a run like this, um, not only just the, the vote finals, and I hope that the voting uh, goes well, of course, but um, it could possibly be a good um, sort of an example of how we could improve our ballot access laws in Indiana. Um, and it could also, um, hope, I'm hoping that it can build a stronger Green Party movement in Southern Indiana in particular. Um, so that we can have a larger influence in years to come. Um, so I'm, I'm from Bloomington, uh, born and raised in Bloomington. I teach grade school. I'm a, a Montessori teacher um, to this day. And so um, I won't go into a big history there, but Maria Montessori was um, a peace advocate. And pretty much after, well, during World War II and beyond, she shifted all of her work to peace education. And so she did great things in all areas of education, but um, she really focused on peace education for the last part of her life. And a lot of her writing and, and her thoughts during that period um, influenced my thinking about world peace. And so um, I love the Green Party because of the key values, the, those 10 key values that most of us are aware of. Um, they fit very nicely with my belief system. And I feel like that those values are things that we can bring to, to Hoosiers in the state. And um, there's obviously a lot of divide um, in Indiana and, and the whole country. And I think the Green Party is um, actually a great way to, to bring people together. I think there are quite a few conservative and Republican Hoosiers that would be interested in voting Green Party um, as opposed to um, sort of the Trumpism that we've all been living through. So um, I think there's a real possibility there. So it's very grassroots. Um, I won't be soliciting money. <laughs> um, I'm going to be, I'm already building a sort of a volunteer network. I have a campaign manager, a treasurer, and we're just sort of getting started. We haven't even announced yet. It'll be late July when we officially announce, but um, love any sort of support people would like to give or just word of mouth um, that you would like to give towards the cam campaign. This is for 2022. So it's we're really ahead of the ball a little bit. Most people you won't hear about until next spring, but I, I want to be ahead of ahead of things on everything. So 
Um, right now, I just have a YouTube channel. It's Jacob Bailey for Congress. The four is the numeral four. Just sort of started it. Um, so I kind of just lay out you know, some of my policy ideas and belief systems, but that's it right now. I think by August, you'll be hearing a lot more. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jacob. So next on the list, I had Ben Smith. Uh, ben Smith is going to run for office. He's not sure what office he's gonna run for. Unfortunately, he had to leave and go to work. Um, he is looking forward to an opportunity in the future. Um, definitely in-person ones to really get to meet a few people and, and talk to you about his campaign and his run. Um, so next up, I would like to introduce Michelle Holliday. And Michelle will be running for Secretary of State. And I'm the person who encouraged Michelle to run. And I'm thrilled that she's accepted the challenge. As requested, Michelle has completed and submitted the paperwork and voting to officially endorse Michelle by the Indiana Green Party will take place in the future. But today I'd ask Michelle to introduce herself to everyone and share a few words about her platform. Michelle, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Terry. First of all, I wanna say I'm very proud to be encouraged by the current chair of the Indiana Green Party, Terry Alm, and I'm thrilled to be running as a Green. I'm proud of all of you. And everything I've heard today is just amazing. Um, a little bit about myself. I was raised by my grandparents on a lake in Northeastern Indiana. And um, it's my belief that the internal qualities of any politician is the most important factor because they represent their fellow citizens. So they have to be open-minded to what everybody else thinks. Also the protection of the earth's natural habitats, which of course are the homes to most living creatures on our planet. I have a very strong sense of integrity and a high degree of foresight. Um, one of the top items on my platform will be returning to our grandparents' way of loving and inclusive and united communities along with the new culture of accepting everyone, which of course is new. I feel that perspective has been lost or not even a consideration of today's, most of today's politicians. And that's the real reason that most people feel left out or left behind or powerless in the wake of government decisions. I have many loved ones who live on the lakes in Northeastern Indiana who are very concerned right now about losing Indiana's natural beauty and financial independence to large corporate takeovers that are being proposed throughout the state of Indiana. I have a very strong economic action plan to protect our state. I was introduced to the Green Party by former Green Party presidential candidate, Dr. Cynthia McKinney uh, during a uh, professional interview. Um, so I've understood our platform before part starting the party. I especially love number eight, which is the respect and to include everyone. I'm very proud to share the news that I've received the formal political endorsement from Dr. Cynthia McKinney, and she will be strategically working with our election campaign. This is a time of fundamental economic change, and Indiana citizens know this. Our state is ready for a new kind of leadership. The two most important things to the citizens of our state are economic security and the protection of Indiana's natural ecosystems, lakes, wildlife. Without a solid plan for economic growth, Indiana right now is being forced to accept out of state businesses, which are demanding allowances to destroy Indiana's wetlands. This is a tip of a very large iceberg if we let it happen. These non-Indiana companies will then be free to leave at any moment, leaving behind the damage of our ecosystems, the loss of jobs, which our citizens will come to depend upon unless Indiana gives in more to the demands from these out of state companies. This will not result in a position of economic strength for our future. I am unaware of any accomplishments or successes of the current incumbent Secretary of State during her time now or in former political offices. The Secretary of State's primary um, duty is to oversee the financial business of every state 
and the election laws. By profession, I am a financial news journalist. My expertise is in covering green energy business development, cryptocurrencies, precious metals, mining, stocks, politics, and blockchain technology, which is currently being implemented into the infrastructure of the entire world's financial banking system. For our Secretary of State not to know this, not to understand this, it puts Indiana behind everyone. I am uniquely qualified to hold this office as Indiana's Secretary of State in order to transform our state into a financial powerhouse of self-sustaining green energy. For our farmers, Indiana-grown hemp production proactively supported by our government will eliminate the fears of losing family farms to forced corporate buyouts. In green technology, research and development of innovations for Indiana-grown hemp production into biodegradable products such as plastics. This is a massive business sector with unlimited wealth and potential. For Indiana's entrepreneurs and business owners, Indiana-grown hemp biodegradable products for distribution on a national and international level, bringing in investment money instead of selling out our citizens who are being forced to watch in despair and frustration as these out-of-state companies come in with plans, actual plans and allowances to destroy our precious wetlands. They're talking about a little bit, but everybody knows that people who get an inch take a mile. One inch of destroyed Indiana wetlands is one inch too much. Indiana will become an economic powerhouse of green technology and innovation built from inside our own state. We will be a contender upon the world's economic stage, standing on very solid financial ground. The leader of green technology is Richard King of the U.S. Department of Energy, director of the DOE's Solar Decathlon, which is an international collegiate competition in building self-sustaining homes. These scholastic competitions inspire fantastic creative inventions, which will provide our state with the foundation to build dynamic new green businesses and innovative ways to eliminate dependence upon fossil fuels. Richard has already been called upon by the state of California to begin their process. He has agreed to make Indiana the next state in this groundbreaking green innovation era. The building of green wealth will become our foundation for Indiana grown hemp to green technology, to biodegradables, to protect our beautiful planet from the inside of Indiana with Richard King as our guide. I'm proud to share with you that Richard King has already given me his official political endorsement as Indiana's next Secretary of State. Finally, I am a very strong proponent of the legalization of cannabis, especially medicinal cannabis. We are way behind, shamefully behind. It's needed by every Indiana veteran, every citizen fighting a disease, all of Indiana's beloved pets can be very well um, recommended and soothed by this natural remedy. I hope to receive the endorsement of the Indiana Green Party in the future, but today I'm just introducing myself, telling you my platform. Um, everyone is free to visit our campaign website. It will be going live soon. It's gonna be at holidayforindiana.com. Um, I will close by saying that I love this state. I am very excited that we have the opportunity right now to build an incredible future of green wealth and innovation in the Secretary of State's office. Thank you so much. I'm gonna give the floor back to the chair. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, we're moving right along and I do apologize to everybody for being behind schedule. We did have a very packed agenda today to get things in in three hours. Um, one last thing before final remarks and adjournment. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you. As you can see, I have a little change of venue. I just got home about an hour ago. <laughs> um, on top of the multiple hats that I wear with between Vigo County and 
between Vigo County and um, the National Committee. I'm also the chair of the fundraising committee for the Indiana Green Party. I reposted into the chat uh, the sign in sheet that most of you filled out. Um, as you can see, we had we have a couple of candidates that are running. We're probably going to have a bunch of events coming up uh, in the near future, especially this year and next year. Um, and like signs, websites, a lot of uh, behind the scenes things. And one of the and all of these can benefit from fundraising, uh, it, donating a little bit of money at a time. Um, like I said, I posted in the chat the uh, spread sign in sheet. If you want to, um, if you want to donate to the Indiana Green Party for you know future uses like the uh, ballot access campaigns. Um, the upcoming ballot access campaigns, other websites, uh, down ticket candidates that may be running and so that we can help us out and grow our party. Um, if you can, if you wanna make a little small donation of like $10, $5 or becoming a sustaining donor, you could sign in the, um, if you wanna do it, a, a um, if you want to pledge a donation, or if you want to join our fundraising committee, where we're going to be like discussing um, ballot access, uh, possible lawsuits in the future too, um, and similar other things, uh, fill out in like your skills or your focus of fundraising, and we'll try to get in, in touch with you. Um, about our next meetings, which are normally on the third so Saturdays of the month at 5, 5 p.m. Um, but the, the first one for this new uh, CC will probably be on a Sunday at 5 p.m. because that's about the same time as the Green Party's annual national meeting. That's the weekend of that meeting. So we'll probably have it it a little bit later. Um, that's pretty much it. And I will get in touch with you if you're interested in fundraising or any kind of other stuff. That's it. Thank you very much, Sarah. And now this does conclude our Congress. Um, there is a the 2021 Green Party Annual National Meeting. This is the Green Party of the US they will hold their annual meeting on July 15th through July 18th. And the theme is dismantling oppression, building solidarity, a green party for everyone. Uh, participants must register by July 9th. I'm gonna throw a link in the chat. Um, and for the Indiana Green Party events, if you wanna connect with your local group or a caucus, I'm also gonna throw the calendar link in the chat to check out our calendar there to be informed of upcoming events. So this first link here, this is the link to register for the GPUS National Convention. Um, and then I'm giving you another link. And this will be the link to, um, to the Indiana Green Party's calendar. So if you have uh, want to know what's going on here, check that link out. Uh, George Wolf, I see your hand up. And I do want, before George speaks, I do want to encourage anyone that wants to stick around and talk uh, informally, you can do that. There will be a social hour after this. George? Yes, I, I want to uh, congratulate Ms. Michelle on her, on her candidacy for Secretary of State. And I thought she gave a fantastic speech here. Um, wonderful platform. And uh, so very good luck, Michelle. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm with you the whole way. Oh, wonderful. That is so amazing to hear, George. I'm so excited. I think, I think we've got a shot at this. I really do with everything that's going on right now. I really, and we have a brilliant party with a brilliant platform. There's nobody in Indiana that doesn't understand what we stand for. That's the truth. So thank you, George. Yes. And if you have any, uh, 
any questions i might be able to help you from my past experience beautiful i will so feel, free to, <laughs> feel free to call me expect or, me okay uh -huh. does anyone have any additional comments before we adjourn and start our informal social hour just to let you know registration for the annual national meeting is not the ninth it's the fifth thank you sarah Okay, Congress is adjourned. Thank you everybody for three and a half hours of your time on a Saturday. And now the floor is open to everyone. Terry, Terry? Yes. Terry? Yes. Can I have one moment? I'd like to suggest that we owe Terry and, and Adam a big debt of gratitude for putting this all together. You've done a wonderful job. Um, thank and you. Thank you both. Uh, for the tech side and the organizational side, round of applause immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everyone.